To be an indie means we buck a system that doesn't want us. To be a fringe filmmaker means we don't do it for them. We do it for ourselves. To be an outlaw on the fringe means we'll die before we fail. Be an outlaw. George! Joe, how in the fuck are you, buddy? I am excellent, man. How are you? What a week, huh? Right. It's been crazy, man. It's like the week of... Um, I didn't get all this done during the opening credits, so just so everybody knows. I'm not just sitting here texting. I am actually starting a bunch of watch parties for our episode tonight. And what because... he was about to refer to was, this is just like doing DEF CON all over again. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, this is all because this is, like Joe said, been a crazy motherfucking week. And so welcome, everybody, to tonight's very special episode of Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade with me, your host, George C. Romero. And with me, as always, my ever faithful and present producer extraordinaire, Mr. Joe Ridgely. Nice hat, Joe. Thank you. I made it myself. Oh, no, I didn't. We got to try to get the rest of your stuff pushed out through the vendor. I noticed that a bunch of orders that have been sitting there for a long time due to this COVID are now starting to get pushed out. So hopefully yours will get to you very soon. And I apologize. This is your friendly customer service representative. Damn you, COVID. <laughs> that was me trying to act. See, that's that, really yeah. work. It, it hurts when you do it. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a crazy week. We had a great premiere last night of Mr. Lauren uh, Lepre's uh, COVID 2024. Oh, it was a me... great little film. I'm sure you have the graphic somewhere. I'm sure I do too. A graphic by Steve Gray. And Steve, you are killing it on the graphics. Thank you very much. For those of you who don't know, Steve Gray has been doing our graphics for the past couple of weeks now. Yeah, very happy to have him in the family now. So anyway, so that episode was great. It was hosted by our very own Drone Cav, Drone Jesus, Mr. Terry Gerald. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Drone Cav is, you're missing the fuck out. Uh, you need to go check out the Drone Cav. Uh, Terry, man, this guy has forgotten more about drones than I will ever learn or want to learn. What I want to know is what Terry can teach me as a filmmaker about how to use a drone to up the production value of my low to no budget films for very little money. Um, let's see. Oh, Lance, Richard Grieco, I love Six Feet Away. So that's the other big thing, right? About an hour ago. About an hour. It just ended about an hour ago. One hour ago on our channel, we did a worldwide... Uh, that's global, Joe. That's not what that means? Uh, yeah, that's what that <laughs> Premiere of uh, literally probably my, one of my best friends on earth, uh, Mr. Richard Grieco's brand new song, Six Feet Away. Uh, this thing uh, rips you apart. It's, um, it's a phenomenal song. I am so unbelievably proud of him, but I don't want to gush too much now because he's going to come on here in a few minutes and we're going to talk and he's going to set it up and we're going to show it here again. Uh, another very exclusive. We're going to keep the worldwide again, Joe, that's global. Um, we're going to keep the worldwide premiere of Richard's song Six Feet Away, a music video for it, uh, going live here on the Romero Pictures Indie Brigade with me, your host, George C. Romero, and the ever-present and faithful producer extraordinaire, Mr. Joe Ridgely. It looks like we've got a lot of people tuning in and showing up tonight. I'm very happy about that. Lance Wagner, first to the party. What's up, Juanita? Thank you for joining in, trying to pull this up on my Amazon Fire, Facebook. What? That's so many tech things, Juanita. I can't with all that. That's just... That's well, just now me. you know how I feel when I'm trying to intro a show with the Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade presents. <laughs> Let's try it again. You didn't sell it. Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade presents... 
I got to get more of a movie guy. I think Romero Pictures, Heavy Metal, Indie Brigade presents. There you go. A little more feeling. You got it there toward the end. Yeah, you need to, you know, it's like this. Romero Pictures, Heavy Metal, Indie Brigade presents. Who do you guys think did it better? (laughs) (laughs) Not even putting that to a vote. (laughs) Man, things are going great. Things are amazing. Life is beautiful. Uh, I have been watching uh, the community, which is probably the best community of online fans I've ever seen. Uh, And, you know, I don't even mean to use that term in a disparaging way, because what I love about our community is that our members call themselves just that. They call themselves members. They call themselves members of the brigade, members of the indie brigade. Uh, They are not just fans. They are not just viewers. That is not just an audience. The Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade is a motherfucking way of life for a bunch of outlaw motherfuckers out there making shit indie all day long. So we pull off the impossible. We have a vision. We get it done. We get it out into the world. And uh, we are proud of each and every one of you and every single project, everything that you put out into the world, whether it's a drawing, a song, a, a short film, a feature, whatever it is, we're proud of every one of you and we're proud that you're here with us. So thank you everybody for being members of the Indie Brigade. Lance is calling you out, by the way. Ha ha. <laughs> I was just fucking with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I very dryly stated earlier that I dyed my beard red, white, and blue for the 4th of July holiday weekend. Um, so happy to let you know that I did not do that. I could not do that. I saw my beautiful wife pop in. Very happy that she always tunes in to support me, uh, even though I do nothing but take credit for all the amazing things she does around the house, like grow flowers, grow crops, cook amazing keto meals. It's all her, um, but I like to take the credit. Joe, what's up? Not you. <laughs> Don't worry. I, I won't get a complex. Trust me. <laughs> Brandon, outlaw motherfucker. What's up, Brandon? How you doing, man? Yeah, Steve Gray is the man. Family of outlaws. Terry, Joe, Brandon. We got people tuning in. Claudio, I hope I said that right. Happy to happy to have you here. Uh, Tim, Tim Melican, I actually got to talk to you. <laughs> now is not the forum. I hope all's going with the, well with you, Tim. Uh, Tim's got some amazing stuff coming up, some great projects he's working on. And I have had the very, very distinct pleasure of kind of trying to help guide him uh, maybe with uh, regard to the approach for some of them. So uh, I feel very lucky to have been part of that and uh we know that everything that you do tim is going to kick ass so we're happy that you're here hi sam we've got uh ron scott in the house who is ron what's up ron scott ron purdy glad to see everybody ron scott folks what's up chuck and ron is actually a drone pilot hey look at that ron terry cage match Nice drone cage match, robotic flying fighting drones. Ooh, can we pay for view that? That's a new show on the Indie Brigade. Damn! Boom! Weapons oh and everything. God. Sure, why not? Drone weapons. A Rod Scott sighting. <laughs> there he is. We've seen him. <laughs> All right, what do we got going on? Drone Let's... Thunderdome. Man, we got so much going on. Let's just whip through our housekeeping here pretty quickly because All right. I want to get my brother Richard up here. And I wanna... Yeah, man. On the second half of the show, we got David Lee Madison's The End of the Night with his guest Dan Parent and Judy Norton. Uh, Dan was a writer and art artist for the Archie comics, and Judy is known for uh, that show that David's addicted to, The Waltz. Yeah, absolutely. That's going to be an amazing show tonight. So I hope everybody sticks around uh, for the third hour of the Romero Pictures Friday night, 4th of July special Indie Brigade Heavy Metal Joe Ridgely may host. See, I don't always get it right either. 
<laughs> you got a new show coming up soon. Yes, man. we do. How cool is this? Dean Fernando, Dino Bullet. I see you there, man. Brother, I love you. I miss you. I can't wait to hug your neck again. And when you and I talked on the phone about getting cinephiles off the ground, uh, man, I was walking on cloud nine for the rest of that day. Dean has one of the most amazing and innate uh, understandings of the historical visual vocabulary of film uh, across all genres, across most countries. Uh, he's, he knows more about the visual vocabulary of, of film across the board than anybody you've ever met. And Cinephiles is a brand new show that Dean is working hard to produce. Uh, and he is going to be speaking uh, with filmmakers on a one-on-one -on -one in a very sort of like, uh, almost like an inside the actor's studio kind of format. Uh, but it's going to be strictly about the visual vocabulary of film, which you guys, if you're filmmakers out there, even if you're, if you're just fans of film, you're not going to want to miss this. I promise you, you will be looking and you'll be looking at and watching movies in a completely different light after you listen to, to this guy, talk to people. Uh, hopefully I'll be lucky enough to do an episode with him. Uh, but if not, I get it. I don't think even I can hold a candle to being able to talk with Dean about this shit. I'm telling you, this guy's brain is unbelievable. So uh, make sure you stay tuned for that. Watch out for the announcements. And do not ever, ever miss an episode of Cinephiles. Uh, just real quickly to zip through the rest of this stuff, uh, we've got Buy Me a Coffee. So, you know, we've got merch available, but we understand it might not be for everybody. A lot of skulls, a lot of things like that. Um, if that's not your bag, but you still love what we do and you want to support us and you've learned anything or you just like spending some time with us or you have fun watching a train wreck, uh, whatever it is, go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash RP Indie Brigade and buy me a coffee because I can't get enough of this shit right here is Killer's Choice, which is actually a coffee company started by Dan Yeager and C.W. Penny and is also the official coffee of Romero Pictures Indie Brigade. So we're very happy for that. Uh, I am running out of it, and I'm also, I need new IVs uh, for it, Dan and CW, if you guys are hearing this, send the coffee and IVs. Um, yeah, so now, if uh, if you do like our merch, which, by the way, was all designed by our very own Ian Steyer, uh, who has designed all of the logos except the Heavy Metal logo, obviously, uh, for the rebranding and relaunch of the Romero Pictures brand and the Romero Pictures Indie Brigade brand, uh, one of the most talented designers and artists I've ever seen in my life. Uh, check out our merch. It's romeropictures.com forward slash merch. We've also got a line of clothing there called Scare Tactical. Uh, this is a special line of clothing designed exclusively for the Romero Pictures merch store. A portion of every sale goes directly toward the Veterans Compound, which, as we all know, is a nonprofit organization that I am working my ass off to get off the ground to help uh, veterans process their experiences uh, through the visual arts of filmmaking and, and creating and stuff like that. So basically, um, yeah, every scare tactical thing you buy, you're helping us help vets. All Which right, so now you're going to have to speed read it. Go. Bam, Romero Pictures, Heavy Metal, Indie Brigade. Remember DEF CON 1, March 28th, 29th? It was the first online-only fan convention. It streamed for eight hours a day for two days in a row. That was 16-plus hours of streaming with celebrities and panels. It was amazing. Right underneath that, we can blame Joe for running out of time. To the right of that, we've got The Nasty Nation, which is currently an audio podcast with our own Chuck Daniels, also known as Chuck Nasty. Uh, it is moving to video soon. We will keep you posted on that. Above that, we've got The Wagner Wiles, hosted by Lance and Samantha Wagner, two of my favorite people on Earth, and their show is super fun. You have to check it out. Above that, we've got The End of the Night, hosted by David Lee Madison, coming up right after tonight's episode of Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade, with me, your host, George C. Romero, and my ever-present and faithful producer extraordinaire, Joe Ridgely. Bouncing down and to the left, we've got The Drone Cab. I already spoke a little bit about it, but it's hosted by Terry Gerald, and the guy will teach you everything you ever wanted to know about fucking drones. To the left, we've got The Devil is Into Detail, which is a beautifully written Written blog by Ian Steyer, the gentleman who I just went over did all of our logos. Above that, we've got Living the Screen with Tiffany Shepis that will be joining the Indie Brigade Network very soon. And above that, we've got What Was I Thinking? Fragments from a Dirty Ashtray, hosted by my dear friend and brother, Mr. Richard Greco, who will be joining us shortly. So keep your eye out for all the announcements. Was that fast enough for you, fucker? Sure. Ed got his shirts today, by the way. Yes. Awesome. Ed, post pictures. 
Who wants us to just take a minute and have Joe bring that up and see if he can do it faster? Say what now? <laughs> You'd be surprised what I can do pretty fast for a fat guy. <laughs> uh, make sure you like, subscribe, and follow us, Romero Pictures Indie Brigade, on the YouTube channel, on our YouTube channel, Facebook page, Instagram, and Twitter. But we didn't get all of the perfect naming convention across all of it, like uh, YouTube and uh, Instagram is Indie underscore Brigade. Facebook is Indie dot Brigade. That's, that's uh, not our fault, man. That's due to their limitations. Yeah, but you know what's awesome is our community has grown so big and so fast that if you just go to your favorite platforms and you search Indie Brigade, you're going to find us. And all you have to do is look for that little circular icon that is the charge of the Indie Brigade designed by Mr. Ian Steyer. Sean Smithson got his shirts today, too. Sean was with us last week, and he revealed this awesome project, woodworking project he's been working on. If you haven't seen pictures of it floating around the internet, go check it out. Sean, we love you very much. Uh, we're so proud you're here, and we're happy that you're working on your very first uh, horror script ever. I see the Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell is here. Naveen, what's up? Naveen, we are actually being watched right now, Joe. Did you know that Naveen is a uh, an Olympic athlete in the sport of ping pong? And he is a bad motherfucker, and he is checking this shit out right now. So that is very cool. Yes, very, very proud that Naveen is here. Amanda, how you doing? Hope you have an awesome fourth as well. Um, the Jimmy Star Show with Ron Russell. What is Jimmy on here? We're it's all right here. I'm, oh wait, I'm actually reading the comments better and faster than Joe too tonight. Damn it! Oh, I'm on my shit. So, Jimmy, thank you. Jimmy and Ron, thank you for joining us. Um, greatly appreciated. Uh, let's see what else we got going. Mm, that was so bad. Let me do that once more with feeling. <laughs> Jimmy and Ron, I fucking love you guys, and I'm so happy you're here. Jimmy, as everybody knows, was a guest on our show once, and hopefully he'll come back soon. He's also a public relations mentor in our mentor program. So if you need help figuring that out, go book a session with Jimmy. And guys in the brigade, do me a favor. Since I just did that, I know there's going to be hell to pay. So if I'm not here next week, search party something. It'll be fine. Hang on, I got to make a note. <laughs> oh, Joe. <laughs> uh, Amanda, uh, we're honored to have you, Naveen. Susie, how you doing? Man, people still showing up. I love this. I love this so much. I love the comments. It's a flood, man. It is. It like, is. I think that's all of our housekeeping. Do we have anybody in the green room by any chance? Uh, they, well, yeah. Would you like me to bring them up? That'd be great. Oh, okay. Brother. Are you there? Can you hear me? Hey, guys. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> Don't do that, man. You can just... <laughs> man. Hey, uh, <laughs> how are you doing, brother? How, how are you feeling? Doing good. Doing good. How are you feeling? You feeling good? You kind of did a pretty big thing today. Um, um, yeah, I feel good. I do. Good. Um, I do. Like uh, I'm exhausted. I don't know why. Um, but uh, I feel good. I have an idea. I have an idea of my, why you might be exhausted. Because you poured your fucking heart and soul into a song yeah. that got released about an hour and fifteen minutes ago. I mean, <laughs> about an hour ago. Yeah, <laughs> released all over the world just about an hour ago. You're actually you're absolutely right. Yeah. Man, I got to tell you how unbelievably, how much good it's doing my heart to look at you right now and just tell you how much I love what you did and how proud I am of you and, and how much I love you, man. Truly, you know, and I, you, I'm, just, I'm so happy that you fucking did this. We got so many people out there in the brigade and out there in the world at large who are, are just so happy about it. The comments were flooding in. Everybody's saying about how, how happy they are to hear you return to music. And for, you know, some of the people watching tonight, they might not know what that means. So, you know, why don't we start with that? What, what do they mean by return to music? When's the last time you put out some music? Um, it's funny because I put it on an album in 1995, did a tour in Europe in 95, 96. And, and at that time, I just released the album in Europe because 
being an actor that was well known at the time that wasn't I was told by all the people around me that you should release it in Europe and not release it in the United States because you're an actor and, and you don't want to uh, do crossover stuff. So that's why I just released it in Europe, which I, actually I'm glad I did it that way. Um, and, uh, and that's been on iTunes. And, I, and, I, and then I took it over, the album, and then I put it on iTunes probably about a year ago and because uh, I own the, the rights to it. So... Um, and uh, it's funny because I've written a lot of stuff since then. I just haven't had the, I don't know, it's strange. Uh, uh, I just haven't put anything out. I mean, I probably got 20, 30 songs. And uh, it's funny talking to you and with Michelle and this whole, this whole uh, um, COVID-19 lockdown, you know, pandemic thing that's happened to everybody across the world, you know, kind of. I mean, it's funny because, like, even uh, the painting I did. I mean, you can you can see the canvas, but it's that time it takes you to actually get to the canvas to actually do something. So when they say how long did it take you to paint, maybe literally it took maybe four or five days, but it actually took about a month. Yeah. Uh, same as this song, uh, I wrote it, and and just in the essence of um, just being, you know. Just, just being locked up and and in lockdown and 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 how all the rules and regulations and trying to get used to that and and uh, and you just want some kind of sense of freedom in a way um, and I, I I wrote it in the sense of a parallel thing of how people must be feeling where you know the whole six feet away metaphor you know um, of six feet away and also you know, six feet under, and also, like you brought up, I think that one time about, um, you're always that, like, six feet away from that, that thing, that greatness, you know, whatever that is. And, Your next goal. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and I think, um, I think visually, you know, because of you and, 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 and all the stuff we did, and, and, uh, it's, it's part of, a taking us back to a, a you know, kind of like a, I don't know, a time when, when, you know, it was okay just to be who you are. Yeah. And, and where, you know, Americans are great, you know, all Americans. I mean, it's a great, we're great people and it's a great country. And uh, it's kind of a reminder of that, like, you know, we're, for me, it, it really is, you know, for me, uh, it, you know, um, in terms of the visuals, you know, like we've talked about this at length and now here we are in the song and the video are out in the world. And it's like uh, it's like a, the same conversation from a completely different perspective. You know, I mean, for me, when I heard it, it was well, like you said, you know, it was six feet away of from anything, whether it's love or a goal or, uh, you know, um, success or. Uh, a loved one or six feet under or anything, you know, I mean, there's so many different meanings and I think it hits so, so hard in the, in the, in the feels, if you will, uh, for so many people. And I think it's because so many people can relate to it on a very personal level, number one, but well, that I, was the plan. Yeah. That was the idea to, to lyrically make it where it is very pragmatic and as far as what it means. There, there's no agenda there's no nothing it just is what it is and i think it brings out emotions and i think everyone can relate to a certain part of it you know um whether it be you know the visuals or or um you know i, I, I can't see my family and friends you know i mean in this whole life of literal pretend you know it, you know we, yeah. we hear things on both sides and we wonder what to believe and what not to believe and we hear one thing one week and then it's it's debunked the next week you know and like it's like we're open no we're not yeah it's like, it's like that person is like that you know that <laughs> gotcha you know um but uh you know we, we i mean america i mean we as far as a country we've been through a lot and i think you know we'll, we'll get through this too um we definitely will. Just, i hope everybody kind of can take something out of it and and uh, and, uh and feel good about it. 
No. I think uh, I, I think that a lot of people will take exactly that from it. And you know, talking about the visuals for me, there were a lot of different ways to go with it, and it was a tricky thing to put visuals to because there's the obvious, right? Um, and then there's the the sort of well, the obvious sort of hitting the nose on the head, and 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 that doesn't really allow people to take their own meaning from it. And that so is. for me, like the the thing that I keyed on in it was love, right? Um, because that's really what it is. It's uh, it's a love, whether it's a love for a goal, whether it's a love for success or someone else's success, or whether it's a love for the way things used to be, or a love for the way things might be again uh, with the the pandemic. You know, whatever it is, it's love. And the best ways for to to show that is with you know, I thought I thought of sort of a love story that never has no resolution. Right. And, and the, um, you know, of course, the 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 railroad is uh, such an iconic sort of symbol of, uh, of America. So, you know, and uh, I, I just it was such a joy and a pleasure to cut and to to do the video and, and sort of, I guess, to, uh, direct it. But, uh, you know, even though we're like we all just did our parts we all did it differently. I mean, Michelle, actually, Michelle, thank God she had that get the, the, the Osmo camera. Uh -huh. that, gave that wide stuff of me, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just kind of crazy. That, yeah. Uh, the, and just the imagery. I mean, uh, and I think it's just kind of a piece of Americana. I really do. You know, just, I got to tell you, working with you on it was one of the absolute best moments of my entire career. And it's something I'll be proud of until the day that I draw my last breath, brother. And, and I, I truly mean it when I say I love you. And I'm just so proud of you for, for what you did and, and the fact that you you know, and it's interesting, too, because a lot of people don't know that you paint. And I remember sort of you were working on a painting that's a phenomenal painting. And if anybody, you know, is interested in that um, or wants to know more about that, go to GreekoArt.com. But literally the next day you said, man, I fucking feel exhausted. And I got this out and you sent me pictures of it. It was amazing. And then all of a sudden the song started just flowing out of you. That triggered the song, the, 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 that painting. Yeah, it actually did. How does that uh, how does that work? Like, how does that work for you as part of your creative process? And then we're going to get into the video. Um, I think um, when I when I there was a lot of things that I've been writing, and then um, I think that came out six feet away stuck with me because it just seemed such a, a kind of a harsh reality of that we're getting, we've gotten to a point where there's no human contact at all. Um, and which is, you know, human being as, as, you know, I mean, innately need human contact. Um, and uh, I mean, inherently. And so, I mean, and then um, it probably was like five pages long what I wrote and then I condensed it down to uh, what, uh, what was there. And I remember that day I talked to you, I was gonna send you something, but you didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I changed the last verse, um, and then uh, we, we, I started. Then I came up with the, with the, with kind of a cool riff for it and a cool vibe for it. And then uh, it's funny because we kind of got it down. Then we were we were gonna do it, and then it didn't work out because of this whole kind of you know, um, um, people being locked up in their houses and stuff. So it was, when it was the best time for for Kyle and the best time for everybody. And, and it finally worked out. And, uh, ironically enough, um, we got it done. And, and I think it was the perfect time to, uh, to get it out there. You know? I really think so too. You know, it's a, it's a great song for this particular weekend, the 4th of July weekend. Um, you know, especially with, uh, I think 18 or more States now locking everything back up. Um, yeah. you know, it's going to be a lot of cookouts at home. It's going to be a lot of people, uh, experiencing their own version of exactly what that song is about uh, for this year's Fourth of July, you know, and and you mentioned Kyle. That's Kyle Blaine Perrin, who was on our show. Uh, he is uh, a phenomenally talented uh, music producer, engineer, recordist, and musician. Um, and he worked with uh, he worked with Richard, and I think that they did some just beautifully, beautifully amazing stuff. Uh, and I think that the creative choices that you made with it, man, you know, even the whole tone of the song being that uh you know it's the whole point of it is that it's something that never you never get there you you're all it's always just six feet out it's just never 
never there. And, and, and even outside of quarantine and lockdown, that's something that people can identify with, especially artists. Uh, and especially film, you know, well, filmmakers and everybody who watches The Brigade, you know, every member of The Brigade yeah. can identify with that on some level. So, you know, on behalf of everybody, I thank you, man, for doing that. And and as your brother, um, I just uh, I'm I'm so unbelievably proud of you and, and proud to call you brother, man. And 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 I, I think if you're ready, I want I want to show the fucking video. All right. Are you cool with that? Yeah. Joe, did you fuck it up? Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Damn. <laughs> Without further ado, I'm going to speak to Richard right now, not George. I'm, I'm going to play your video, brother. <laughs>
Boom. Man. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I, I felt the need to applaud. <laughs> That's Joe's reaction when he yeah. wants to cry. Well, I wanted to hold the lighter up, but I don't. I'm, I'm telling you, it's, you know, I have it coming through my studio monitors here and I had it up loud and it just gets me every time, man. Like, it, like it, it never, ever doesn't hit me harder. Every time I hear it, it hits me harder. Some different part of it, a different note, a different word, a different anything, every time. And it all depends on my mood and where I'm at emotionally when I hear it. And I can't stress that enough to you that's something that i think is so has it's so hard for a song to do you know what i'm saying joe well the the only reason i came up is michael mandeville is in the background saying nicely done so i yeah. just wanted to let him know that we're gonna bring him up here quick joe illage is uh from heavy metal uh who's now the chief executive uh editor i believe is his new title at heavy metal magazine yeah. Congratulations on the song debut, Amanda. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful music. I'm telling you, man, you fucking nailed it. You killed it. I, I you know, I'm trying to give you a, a, a sound bite with no bad language. It's, but I can't because I like I lose words when I hear it. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, so fucking. Cool. It's, it's pretty much, but again, you know, um, it's just kind of like a, I don't know, kind of everything that you want to do and you want to believe. But when you're, the one, it's just, when you're kind of like stuck and in, in, in they're telling you everything to do, you know, it's, it's a, I mean, the imagery of, of the bikes and the, and, and the mountains and, and the girl and just everything's apart, you know, and there's no closure yet that we have. Um, and, uh, but yet it's, it's a song about, you know, we will prevail, you know, mm -hmm. we will get through this and, and get through this stronger than, than ever. You know? Very well said. Very well said, you know, and, and, you know, you're right, the visuals. And I, I do want to give a shout out to Michelle because the, her footage is amazing. She got some, and a lot of the stills we've yeah. been the promoter came from her. And, you know, you can tell in some of the, the stills we picked, you can even tell that the pictures were taken with love, right? They were taken of you by someone who's got just love for you, you know? And there's just, there's like, there's a reason that love is what I landed on when I was trying to visually tell the story. And, um it's just it, dino said it best too you you put your heart out there nothing but respect you know i mean you absolutely did you know and you and i it's funny because we have a lot of these conversations over call of duty <laughs> we play this we play this horribly violent video game which is such an irony <laughs> And we have these conversations, and, uh, you, you know, and it's it's awesome. But uh, I mean, just I, I'm so so happy. And you know, what I'd like to do is just kind of we, we advertised a Q and A with you, and we've had some really nice comments pop in. There was one a while ago, and I'm not even sure if uh, Michelle Yanova is still here. Joe popped it up earlier, but um, she set an alarm. It's like the middle of the night where she is, and it's 3 a.m. Uh, and she set an alarm so she wouldn't miss the premiere of your song and video. And, of course, the interview, um, you oh, you know, <laughs> I think you got a hardcore fan there. She yeah. in uh, southeastern Europe. Awesome. Uh-huh. 3 a.m. She set an alarm. <laughs> She's only disappointed you weren't the biker. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, these are the production issues that we're facing right now with COVID and quarantine. You know, I mean, it's just how it goes. Uh, I do have Michael who did want to say. Yeah, bring him up for a minute. I would love to have Michael come up and. Hey, how are you guys doing there? Good. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing great, Richard. That's a fantastic song. Uh, um, I got to tell you, as soon as I started listening to it, it and I hope you take this as a compliment, but I thought back to 
my concert going days with Pink Floyd, that deep guitar feel uh, that just is philosophical and it's spiritual and it's otherworldly and um, has a profundity to it that you don't usually get. And uh, I, I'm just going back to these deep echoes um, for my concert going and appreciation for music that it hit. And I'm actually a bit surprised uh, about that, <laughs> but it, it's great. <laughs> You re he really nailed it, Michael. I mean, I'm telling you, this is uh, good one, though. <laughs> this, this came from a, a this fight, I, you know, just from my perspective, it came from a place of purity and rawness uh, from Richard that I think, um, you know, not a lot of people have the balls to put out in the world like that. You know, I agree, and I, uh, uh, I think the metaphor of six feet away, uh, it's seemingly uh, an arbitrary figure. To some degree. Pardon me? Hmm? Richard's getting choppy. Oh. Are you there? Richard? I'm a... Here, drop out and drop back in. Like, leave and come Go. back. Oh, uh... Internet issue, I guess. Oh. Yeah. While, while he's oh. doing that, um, it, this is a good question. George, you want to take this one? So, yes, I'm actually very happy you brought this up because in the passion about talking about the song and everything else, we didn't uh, give a very important shout out. And I do apologize for that. Terry Gerald, our resident drone Jesus from the Romero Pictures drone cab, is responsible for the drone work in the video. Um, the, the cinematography um, was there. It was it was shot by several people, including Michelle Christine. Uh, out in uh, in L.A. Uh, on the day when Richard was uh, recording in the studio. And um, and then we've got Terry's drone work. And, and uh, you know, it was just about sort of shot selection, Brandon. It was about finding a story and for a song like that. And, um, Michael, I, you know, it's interesting because for a song like this, you just listen to it over and in. It's kind of like what Richard said about, you know, a painting. You, you, you. Hi again. Hi there. I don't know why I said that. He's a little choppy. Yeah. Give it a second. Maybe it'll calm down. Um, you know, Richard, Thank you, Michael. when you do a painting, sometimes oh. it's a month before you walk up to the canvas yep. and it's the same thing. I just listened to the song over and over and over until the story hit me. And when it hit me, it hit me like a ton of bricks and then it just cut together like butter. Hope that answers your question, Brandon. That was sneaky DJ. <laughs> Terry Gerald on fire, Lauren. Uh, Naveen. I've had to social distance all my life due to rare heart condition and many heart surgeries, but hearing this song brought me closer than I've ever felt, closer than six feet. In fact, thank you. That's from wow. our Olympian, Naveen P. Kumar. Wow, nice compliment there. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Michael, I don't think you heard this in the beginning. Naveen is uh, an Olympian uh, ping pong uh, champion. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah That's yeah, very yeah. impressive. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, Naveen's awesome. Yeah. yeah Rockstar. Richard, is your connection back? You're still a little is he choppy to anybody yeah. else but me? Yeah. I'm really choppy. Yeah. Wait, maybe wait, it's but is I it... heard the Pink Floyd reference, Michael. So thank you. <laughs> I think you're back now. I'm gonna There we go. Him. Good. Yeah, I think he's yeah, okay. I think you're back. Are you there? Richard? Hello? Yeah, that's better. That's yeah, that's much better. Okay. All right, cool. Can you hear me? Yeah, so let's try to do some Q&A if anybody out there um, has any questions or, or wants to talk. Brandon had a great question uh, that we addressed while you were out and about, uh, Richard. It was about the cinematography, and we just talked about that and how Terry did the drone stuff. Um, Brandon then says, you know, I have to write the theme song for the reboot of Booker. Hashtag bring Booker back. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, they we're talking about that right now, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Booker bringing Booker back. Yeah. Um, Hopefully that'll be a thing. Let's see. You did answer, George. Thank you, yeah. good sir. Congrats to all involved in the video. Um, I'm just kind of scrolling through. I'm still here, even if it's already 4:46 a.m. here. This is your south. Uh, I don't remember somewhere south, southern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at that. She's with a friend that she met 
um, out of love for your movies. Very awesome, awesome. Michelle. We're very happy. Oh, that's terrific. That's, that's yeah. Uh, first, at, there you go. First athlete to add. This is Naveen P. Kumar, our Olympian viewer tonight. Uh, first athlete to actively compete with Parkinson's disease at an Olympic level. Grateful to still be alive and be here with you all. And your song, uh, he just said probably one of the nicest things anybody's ever said um, about anything I've ever seen anybody do. <laughs> so, <laughs> what a great guy. I'm really happy he's here tonight, you know. Um, yeah. Quite a compliment. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah, that'd be a great guy. And, you know, the interesting thing about Nabina just what uh, saying there that, uh, you know, they're Parkinson's Olympic level. Um, I mean, come on. Uh, how many people can say, oh, I don't know. I can't get motivated today. Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, that's like people complaining about the scratch on the SUV. There's so many <laughs> other perspectives you could get to have gratitude in your life despite some nominal thing like that, much less what um, Naveen went through to get to that level. Yeah. Uh, gratitude. Absolutely. Yeah. It, yeah. it was so apparent right there. So we've got another guy, Gregory Marks, uh, Richard, that says, reminds me of Leonard Cohen. Some was really awesome. That's interesting. Was Cohen ever an influence on you at all? Yeah, he was. Um, um, Leonard Cohen spent most of his time in Montreal. Yeah, I got a great man, great uh, guy who uh, wrote some amazing stuff. I love Leonard Cohen, one of my one of my all time favorites. Him and actually him, Kowski. Um, but Leonard Cohen, uh, when he put it to uh, and John Waits too. I mean, but uh, Leonard Cohen specifically was just, I think, a genius. Yeah. You know? Scotty, uh, Scotty from the Spacing Effect wants to know. Are you planning on recording more songs? Yeah, I'll answer for Richard. That's a yes. <laughs> <laughs> so he's committed. Yes. I'm, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> this is something you and I talk a lot about. Right? <laughs> you know? um, yeah. I, I, what do you think? Do you want to do more songs? Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate it, brother. Do you, do, you, do you want to do more songs? Yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, we got the... Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it, man. We got more coming. Donna says, this song hits me on so many levels, not just with the pandemics, but with mental health health issues, too. So mm -hmm. this is what I mean. This song is going to touch everybody yeah. in, in its own way. It's funny. That's one thing that, that, uh, that people in... You know that we've been listening to. I don't want really watch the news much anymore. That I haven't really brought up is the mental health issue of this whole thing, because we're not the type. We're not. I mean, our 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 makeup is not that of of, of being told and being encased in 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 a, in a in a confine. You know, we're 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 beings that like human contact. Like we said earlier, we like to be out. We like to socialize. We like to do things, and. Uh, and uh, I think uh, a lot of people, you know, if, if they had some type of mental illness to begin with are, are, are struggling right now with that. And that's a real problem that they don't really address right now. And I think they, they really have to. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's very cool that it, it touches somebody who's, who's brave enough to make a comment and a compliment like that. Chuck Daniels wants to know, uh, are, are you a fan of Mark Lanigan by any chance? Uh, because I think that um, he, Chuck actually messaged me after the premiere and said uh, that it, he actually mentioned Mark Lanigan to me, and he said Mark Lanigan and and, and Cohen as well. So um, yeah, so, Mark Lanigan, yeah. great too. So yep. Damon uh, Williams wants to know what came first for you, acting or music? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think acting did. Um, it came came first. I started writing, actually, writing fragments, poems, whatever you want to call them, um, in the eighty six, eighty seven, um, and I wrote. I started writing a lot while I was on the set of Jump Street, and then it just progressed from there. So I started getting into music 
more and more like 89, 90. And then I just I hung out with a lot of musicians and stuff and, and kind of wrote with them and stuff and did things with them. So, I mean, it's just it's just a, uh, another conduit of, of, of being, you know, someone who's got a crazy brain and is creative and likes to do things and, you know, and, uh, and then the painting came because, you know, when you write, you're writing and then you write so quickly, you know, that the next morning you can't understand what you wrote. Uh, <laughs> so that's where the painting comes in because, you know, you can actually, you know, assault the camera, you know, and, but when you wake up the next morning and you're like, well, I have no idea. Is it cursive? Is it, is it, is it, what is this writing? I mean, is it French? I mean, I have no idea. Sometimes I write backwards too. I look in the mirror like this. <laughs> uh lance says uh gold richard love it lance we love you so so proud of you guys uh amanda adams how long does it take to make a music video i think that whole process how what would you say how long did that whole process from song to finished take wow um a couple of weeks two three weeks yeah yeah it was actually really fast that's bad. out there. Good for you guys. Yeah, yeah. it's actually pretty bad. <laughs> you didn't have time to think about it and just kept moving forward with a deadline, and that was that. That's great. Yeah. Sometimes the pressure cooker is the best way to go. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, Juanita wants to know. Juanita's a big fan of yours. Wants to know what's your favorite movie that you've done. Oh my! Probably my favorite movie I've been in. I mean, a lot of them have. I have. I, I have certain things about them that I love. But I think probably my favorite was the Apostate with Dennis Hopper. Um, my my personal favorite, just because of the working with Dennis for one thing, and just the content and, and shooting in Puerto Rico and just the whole feel of the film. So I think probably that. And uh, the most fun I've ever had on set is probably a Husky Kill, because that was just fun. I mean, <laughs> the whole thing, and what a, I mean, it's just fun. And and when I heard like Roger Daltrey was going to be in it, I was so excited, even though he's only in it in the beginning. But it's like you know, you got Roger Daltrey in it, so that was like, you know, then Linda Hunt was brilliant, and you know, Roger Reese and everybody, just great cast, great great group of people. Well, you brought up Hopper a minute ago, um, and I know that you guys were very close. Um, you know, and it's interesting because, uh, mm. you, you know, you, you talk uh, to me a lot about sort of uh, how he was a big influence on you to always push forward uh, with your art and with uh, everything creative in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's probably one of the reasons that I, I mean, the main reason that I made it public, my art, because I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable. I mean, with making it public and he's what he loved my work and he just said uh, um, it's not about you you know it's, it's about them you know i mean it's it, it, you know you're putting emotion on the canvas but but you know you don't know if you're a conduit or, or, of, of all emotion that's coming from another place so you know what you're doing is for that out there not for just you to keep it in your home you know and so it took me about seven years to kind of register it but uh, then i made it public in 2000 Nine. Well, I'm happy you did, man. Uh, I got to tell you. Oh, my wife just made a comment too. She said I, I lost a loved one two months ago. You know about this. Um, in addition to the pandemic and social distancing, six feet away means something different to me these days. Just beautiful. Um, you know, she was one of the, one of the litmus tests. I mean, because we were doing this under cover of night, basically, and uh, you know, uh, I, I remember yeah. I, I called you up and I said, look, on the one hand, I'm your song completely wrecked my wife and then on the other hand i was like but your song completely wrecked my wife <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know and, uh, I, I, it really does it, it just it means something so different to so many people who will hear it and i'm just so proud of you again man um you know, is there anything yeah, else? Thank uh, you so much. And, and I love you and, and thank you for. You know, um, I I got to tell you, Richard. No, I'm, just, I, I'm happy the way. 
Sorry. Oh, I was just saying that, you know, when he was talking about the six feet and, uh, you know, what came to mind is um, Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that came to mind, but the idea that the six feet, like you said, six feet under, a person is described as six feet. It's, it's probably the most common measurement we know, but it's also one that uh, we we measure distances in terms of the lengths of our hands, our arm lengths, our, 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 our heights. So I think there's something uh, very fascinating about, you know, they, that you, they pick that, but uh, I think it's common to understand, but I think that there's some echo there with Vitruvian man that I got. And I, I just got to ask, you know, if you being an artist that kind of has an echo for you maybe, but, Yeah, I mean, now that you th now that you say it in that context, I mean, because the the actual origin of this of this song started with me going back and painting again, mm. and from painting <laughs> originated the song. There we go. Originated video, and then wow, it, it was one of the most so many things. That you, in Good the song, go. <laughs> riff man Rit, like give give us tell tell people like one more thing of you like what's the most visceral moment what's the most visceral piece of that song for you as the artist who created it what was the hardest part for you to let go into the song i wanted uh, um it's it, i i was kind of um, torn on, on how to sing it and, and which way to go. And I wanted an ethereal type of vibe with it that was almost a, a haunting vibe, you know. Um, and I wanted it in, I wanted the vocals really up front. Um, and I think uh, as far as the lyrics, um, you know, uh, I can't see you failing. Yeah. The last step in the song. I hear you, man. I, uh, I absolutely hear you. And, and I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart and we're going to let you go here. Um, if, uh, if you're cool, I, I would love to play the video one more time, but, um, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna let you go and, yeah. and kind of relax, man. It's been, uh, it's been a, a very intense road watching and, and one of the best, literally one of the best moments of my career working with you on this. Uh, I'm so proud of you and I love you from the bottom of my heart, man. Uh, I'll give you a call later and we'll go shoot some people on call of duty. Awesome. Sounds good. <laughs> I'll see you, man. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna hit that video one more time. All right, and then we'll get we'll get rapping about uh, about creative and COVID and all the other stuff there, Michael. You got it. it sounds I, great. I actually want to see if maybe you want to maybe talk about a little little animation piece that you sent me earlier. Sure, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, folks, you're going to want to stick around for that animated piece. Trust me. <laughs> All right, without further ado, here is Richard Grieco's video. One, three, two, one.
so Couldn't believe you walked away Guess it was a rainy day Saw the writing on the wall But I was just too big to fall Now you're gone, you went away I guess everything isn't the same, oh yeah Six feet away, six feet away, yeah. I can't see you, family or friends, during this life of literal pretend. Told I can't walk outside, still don't know the reason why. Had to change the lighting in my background after that. Right. For anybody watching, just so you know, the song, the single, the new single, Six Feet Away by Richard Grieco, is now available for purchase on iTunes, uh, in the iTunes store and in the Google Play store. It's also available streaming everywhere that streams music, Spotify, Apple Music, all that stuff. But do me a favor, if you love it, if you love what it represents, if it speaks to you, go and spend 99 cents and uh, buy you a copy of it. Um, hey. Richard poured a lot of himself into that, all of himself into it. It was one of the most beautiful processes I think I've ever seen. So, Dino, I love you, man. Um, I don't know if anybody can hear my dogs going nuts. I think people are setting off fireworks. Um, Lance, amazing Richard Grieco. No limit to listening to this song. Beautifully stated, Dean, my wife. Uh, Lance in this crazy effing year, best thing to come out of 2020, in my humble opinion, Dino. Um, thank you, Juanita, very much. Um, it's just a beautiful story. 
Uh, Sean says we're making his eyes leak twice in an hour. Uh, <laughs> imagine this to help with the veterans and PTSD and the other traumas and, and learning to live life. That's right, Susie. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm hoping it really speaks to a lot of people on those levels. Um, Terry, you're right. Damon, glad Richard was able to put this out. Terry, the best 99 cents you'll spend on anything. You're absolutely right. Uh, and you're supporting independent art. So moving on, now that I've had a few minutes to compose myself and wipe my eyes. And anyway, Michael. Hey, that's just a beautiful song. It really caught me by surprise. And I genuinely mean that with the. Uh, because Pink Floyd is amongst the, the concerts I saw. I saw the Wall concert, the Dark Side of the Moon concert, the, the Animals concert. Um, I mean, I think I've seen him 35, 40 times, you know, wow. uh, the Floyd. And so there, there's that means something to me when I tell him that. But it had this moment where almost traditionally then the song would pick up in rock and roll and go in a certain direction. But he... He kind of kept the tone. It's kind of like the, uh, I liken it to the idea of remember Sex Lies and Videotape when Steven Soderbergh did this long shot and he just stayed on it. Mm -hmm. And if you were like an ADD kind of commercial director, you would have chop, 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 chop. But he put the camera across the living room, and just stayed on it and let the actors do their work. And some kind of element there was a, a, in play, at least to me, with Richard. He was just staying in the groove that he found and letting it speak for itself. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's definitely a song that makes you think. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And I think it's going to speak to everybody who hears it independently in their own personal way that, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, is that moment that they share with the, the person in the mirror, you know, which is them alone and, nothing else out there, just them and their feelings. And I think that uh, people are open to hearing it that way. I think that, um, I think he's got a, a, you know, something really special that he just put out. So. Yeah, I agree. Michael, welcome back to Romero Pictures Indie Brigade. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Sorry. thank you, Joe. Oh, absolutely. And it looks, I think, I believe Michael has a question about Dean's work. Do you not? Yes. Uh, you said he's doing cinephiles, lang the language of film in... The language of, uh, or discussions about the visual vocabulary of film. Oh, okay. Yes. Because I think I think that's profound, because I always collect a lot of books on cinema and the language of film. Daniel Erijan is one of the first books I got, and I just about wore that out, but you couldn't find a lot of books in the beginning uh, about framing, about composition, about... A lot of that theory so i kind of collect those so i'm kind of keenly interested in that um i thought it also might have to do with different languages when i w was filming in france or in cairo or south korea you got to learn some elements there what you can do can't do when you talk to people mm -hmm. so i was kind of thinking it might be that i know in france you know you want to learn melt and putain which are the two words that you need for french filmmaking you know? <laughs> and <laughs> If you throw up your hands and just say that, they go, oh, okay, he's fixing it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that seems to be the way to go. So I think, you know, that's what intrigued me about Dean. To well, what, me there. what I want to see is I want to see you on Dean's show. Uh, oh, that and, would be fun. Yeah, I think that would be a super great episode. You guys do not live far from each other. Um, so uh, I think that this is something that we can make happen. Uh, it is more toward the first sort of part of what you thought it was going to be. It's more about the actual vocab vocabulary, the visual vocabulary of film as a, as a creative art. So, oh, um, I love that. There's a lot of there's a lot of folks out there making low to no budget films who, um, you know, might not be aware of uh, people like Jack Cardiff, for instance. Um, you know what I mean? They're pretty they're, young. Right, exactly. Great. Yeah. And, you know, these guys, these are the guys that invented the way, and you and I have discussed this a lot, these are the guys that invented what we as the audience have been trained to unconsciously recognize as quality production value. So yeah. in other words, what, what the handheld stuff in the Bourne movies looks like looks the way that it looks to us because it was done by people who understood that the handheld filmmaking style was invented by in a time in the 40s when it took a crew of 12 people 
to do a handheld shot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's you know? absolutely true. Yeah, given yeah. those old Mitchell cameras, right, with, with the blimp and everything else, the Barney put over it or anything else, right, and. Yeah, so you know, and I, we've talked about this a lot too. So back then, when somebody was making a, a handheld motion with the camera, it was the entire the their entire body moving, trying to keep the camera stable, but ah. their, their body right. Sure. And now we've got cameras where we've got a mirror here, and your hands are directly on that mirror, and just the simple act of breathing will shake that or move yeah. it or, you know, and then we've got people that do this to get a handheld shot as opposed to doing, you know, this, which is literally the difference between a bad handheld shot and a high quality big studio handheld shot. Essentially, I mean, if you break it down, right? I mean, yeah. or am I wrong? I mean, I don't think. No, so. I think you're absolutely right. And I think the idea of uh, when people go back, not unlike what Richard was talking about with his art, that making sense of something within the frame. And what is the relationship in the frame? What is that information and the emotion it conveys uh, is so critical that, uh, I mean, if you look at a movie and you have the time to do this kind of composition, it depends on what you're doing, what's the point of the film in some ways, but, um, Every, every film is made up of a series of single shots. So each one, ideally, if you craft a film, you'll have the time to do that. Uh, and as you become a little more hectic and chaotic, you plan the head to try and work that in, um, at least a fair amount of it artistically. Some will go by the wayside just simply because you go, we got to go get this shot. We can't, you can't seek perfection on an eight day shooting schedule. <laughs> so pick out some, what I would call keyframes that set the tone. And those keyframes, much like anything on an After Effects panel or uh, Premiere Pro or anything like that, people familiar with that term, how do you set the tone and selects scenes very pointedly? Uh, if if you are doing filmmaking with a calculator and you're rushing into things and you have eight days to shoot the whole movie, um, you know, the more preparation you have and know where you can put the camera, where you can set it, what you're trying to get composition wise, the better. And um, I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, if you look at Star Trek, I think it was the first J.J. Abrams Star Trek. And I like Star Trek uh, a, a great deal. But on that film, I think they had 22 people in the previs department. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know if you're, how much you're direct. You're not making this up as you go. That's for damn sure. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, the visual effects people will freak out and go, what are you doing? You know, just that. Yeah. He started that walk with his left foot. We clearly previsited it with his right. That's it. No, no, no. That's it. Reset. <laughs> Back to one. <laughs> it, uh, it, it's that kind of a metric, you know? Well, but and it's interesting because I'm going to, I'm going to key on something here and, uh, you know, because I want to, we're, we ran a little long tonight and I'm, I'm really happy that you were part of that conversation. Oh, it was great. So, Most enjoyable. You no, know, uh, it really was something I feel that was special and kind of important that we did tonight. And, uh, I'm really proud that you were here as one of my oldest friends uh, on earth. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Genuinely and dearly love with all my heart. Um, but you said filmmaking with a calculator. Yes. That's, COVID-19. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a little phrase I coined if, some years ago because inevitably doing a budget on a film, people never have enough money. So inevitably um, you have to come up with solutions. Yes, and so it, you could take that as a an accordion effect. Filmmaking with a calculator is different on a twenty million dollar movie. Believe it or not, you go, "What do you? We got all the money in the world. What are you talking about?" Or a thirty million dollar movie. But in every particular facet, you are stretching things to the limit in many cases. So most every case. So uh, indeed, and then we further branch that into the COVID scenario. Uh, you have entire departments that are being created. There was notably yesterday or today uh, a SAG, and you and I talked about it briefly, 
SAG issued a stop work order on a Michael Bay film called Songbird because they were not adhering to these protocols, COVID-19 protocols. Now, admittedly, I don't know if they were a little cloudy on the protocols or the um, mechanism hadn't been fully employed or it's not quite the, a well-oiled machine to do all the requirements. So it could have been a combination of any of those. I mean, I'm not really sure, but um, I also wonder if SAG had started to work with them through the process to clarify it or just shut them down. And I, you know, that's a question. Um, oh, yeah. So, but indeed, I think that um, if you go back to the creative aspect in COVID and where we are now in the ultra low indie filmmaker, et cetera, um, I think it's really going to start with your script and trying to find those pieces where it is, I almost want to say you're going to code everything. You mm -hmm. know, here's the ones where people are close. Here's the twos where, oh, I think maintaining this separation and the protocols are going to be a little easier. Um, and three, not a problem. I mean, i.e., on number three might be establishing shots uh, where people are walking into the house or drive, pulling up in their car, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then I think this number two might be, well, we're in the store together. So how do we manage someone going down an aisle and someone else going down an aisle and et cetera, this kind of a choreography. And then one is the, the, the ones where it's like, uh, husband and wife having intimate dinner. Okay, this is this <laughs> this is going to take some work here. <laughs> or, or you know, special date night, interior bedroom, right? Well, let's book our tickets to France because that's where that's allowed. Yeah, that's right. They're the first ones to bring kissing back. So in you know, and in movies, you know, you got to leave it to the French on that. At least they lead the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, there's, I, I was thinking of this solution because I knew you and I were going to talk about this. And I said, who is an actor and an actress that you would hire that are married to play a married couple on the screen? Now you've just gotten around all those issues going, yeah, we're going to see each other at home. So we're fine here. <laughs> and, you know, is that the kind of thing where you think that's a pretty awesome and creative solution? Is that the kind of thing that some place like a SAG would accept? Well, I think that you could probably get the actor and the actress go, wait, we're not divorced. You mail our residual checks to the same place. Is that is that good enough to know? I um or an affidavit, I imagine, but <laughs> I, I think they'd probably feel um ideally if they can work together well, that's another question, of course, and they have to be right for the part and everything like this. So I mean there's a lot of givens in there. But yeah. I, but I was literally thinking if you had to have that, then that's a solution, isn't it? I'm not saying it's an easy one or maybe couples will get more offers than not in some areas. Um, their stock just went up some degree. Yeah, it is it is definitely uh, sometimes a real trip working with couples, though. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've seen some that are scrappy on the set. And then, you know, as soon as that's over, it's like, they're off making dumplings and watching movies together. And in the meantime, you're like, geez, I think they threw furniture at each other on the set. You know, it's kind of bizarre. In the script. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, is that, did I not get the pink pages? <laughs> Am I missing a, a rewrite here? You know? <laughs> oh, man. Well, listen, so, so back to filmmaking with a calculator, back to creative problem solving. Um, it's because you know, you and I, we set out to have this, we had these, um, altruistic intentions for our COVID series, and we were going to discuss COVID and production from various different perspectives and, mm -hmm. and departments and different ways of how it is affecting production. And what has happened is, uh, they, every discussion has circled back to the creative and, you know, it's like one of those things where if one person tells you, you know, that something sucks, okay, fine, take it with a grain of salt. If a dozen people tell you that something sucks, maybe 
think about it. Honest look. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're being a jackass. I mean, there's the bottom line, you know. Well, right. I got I got the guy at the gas station telling me then this is pretty bad. I see him once a week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so with that sort of philosophy in mind, um, it has dawned on me that the the solution to independent production in the times of COVID is your creative 100%. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think that because uh, we were talking about Dean earlier and composition and the language of film. And so if uh, one thing I'm doing is learning, uh, working to learn uh, French as I go over there for business, etc. And it's a perplexing language at times. I, I used to be fair at it. Uh, I've read, I could read French, but speaking, you know, becomes like, what the hell did you just say? I mean, it becomes, it's a challenge. Um, but if we think about language, language has its, uh, when you're on a film set, you better know maquillage is makeup. You, you have to know what those um, very particular words are, whatever industry you're in. And right now we need to create new kinds of words in relation to, let's say, Dean's uh, concept of the film language to get the emotional creative metric across, yet work within the context and limitation of the COVID scenario. So we have a free form kind of movement where the language itself could be, oh, we have a deep focus here and we are setting the character at the far end uh, deep focus of the character, you know, the typical Orson Welles kind of shot there, where you are making, diminishing the other character. So there you actually have a, a, a use of deep focus that coincides with the COVID requirement. So in what other ways are you doing something like this? A, a shot of a frame within a frame. Well, now if you have somebody who's outside, uh, and they turn and yell to somebody inside, and that person inside comes to the glass door going, yeah, what do you want? You know, because the air conditioning's on. I'm not opening the door. Right. That kind of a thing. Now they're separated, but you get a frame within a frame. Uh, do you have some kind of emotional content you want to convey that way? So it's kind of like saying, well, I, I've got this lens through. I'm looking, but I'm putting two filters on the front. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you used a term, you coined another term, I believe. I did? Oh, this is good. This is good shit. You catch these when you throw them out there. Uh, the emotional creative metric. Oh, there we are. Oh, that was a good one, huh? Yeah, it is. And it's interesting <laughs> because there are two very, very intangible things there. And the third word just ties it all into the pragmatic uh, logistical approach to production. And it's, it's, I fucking love your brain because mm. the emotional creative metric of film and how it ties into the visual vocabulary and the language of film, you know, I believe that we're talking about things that a lot of low to no budget filmmakers might not even realize that they're not thinking about. Mm, interesting. Development, for instance, because you brought up Citizen Kane. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, and you brought up, um, somebody who's not opening the door because the air conditioning is on. These are deep, uh, these are deep looks into the psyche of the character. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, and so filmmaking is so much more than just writing a script with words and kills and the whole thing. There is so much to the language of it and so much to the vocabulary that goes into the images that you create sound being, you know, a completely different conversation, but oh, yeah. so kind of the same because with both, you know, if you think about it, I don't remember who said, I think, was it Spielberg who said film is uh 50% uh, image and 50% sound. And then Danny Boyle said it was more like 70 to 80% is sound and, you know, and stuff like that. And um, you know, but the emotional creative metric, is something that I, I would love for you to just I, remember those words that you said. Sure. I have <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I think we'll be using that as a little cue between us every once in a while. So how are you doing today, uh, Cameron? How's your 
emotional creative metric. You know, I think well, it'll be our form of hello, right? Something like that. Because we'll be really strange guys. <laughs> You know, today it's a little bit off, Michael. I feel like I shifted everything three cells to the right. and <laughs> We have to do it in front of a waitress at a restaurant. I'm just saying so she could like, I just hope these idiots tip, you know? I mean, that'll be kind of what she's going to be thinking right there, you know? As soon as we're allowed to be in a restaurant. <laughs> noir, me and George C. talk about that, a new language of storytelling that will evolve. Fuck yeah. That's, that that's exactly right, Dean. And um, when you actually have this uh, a triad of creativity, what you do is you have the writing, and then you have the method of transforming the writing into something tangible. And whether Richard was had something in his head, and then uh, we actually think in terms of image anyway. If I say bicycle, Everybody now has the image of a bicycle. It could be the one they grew up on. It's one they just saw. But they don't spell out the word bicycle in their head. What we do is we take the word, the image of bicycle, we write it down on a script as a bicycle. And then, of course, many times you'll find in filmmaking, you could ask 10 people on a movie. They all have a different idea of what that bike should be. One will say in relation to the character, oh, I'm, I'm sure this guy is, you know, got a a, a really nice racing bike. Another says a cruiser. Another says it's an old Schwinn. Another says it's whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the collaborative art. Hence a director to direct it. But then we have to retranslate it from the written script back to the image and um, make it tangible. And so that's the second leg of that. And the third will be what's the language of that emotion conveying it? Because Richard did this beautiful song, and you and I have talked about film where if people aren't vested in the characters, and we've all seen these Hollywood movies that uh, are expensive, um, hyper expensive and ridiculous, and I feel nothing for the characters. And then I could see a movie that costs almost nothing and go, no, I really want to know what's going to happen to that person. Mm -hmm. And that's that uh, I think that's the problem in Hollywood is that the movies become slick, but they don't become engaging in, in many cases. They're too slick for their own good in some odd way. Mm -hmm. And I think that it becomes vacuous. It becomes um, less fulfilling as a viewer, as somebody who appreciates trying to, I mean, all movies, songs, operas, novels, poems, everything, everything is about the language, about how we take one person's experience and hope to better ours. That's right. That's it. If I see that movie, I'm going to be, I, I'm going to understand a little bit more about this or that, or, or have this feeling that I too can succeed or, you know, a hundred, a hundred emotions. Mm -hmm. So how do you capture that and convey it? And that's, I think the third leg which we talked about with, uh, you know, Dean and the language of film, et cetera, there. So I think that's an interesting aspect of having those three in relation to the COVID scenario and using that kind of, you know, first code everything, then go, how do you convey the emotions? I mean, you have to go through uh, a process. And I think that's why if you're doing a film and you have no money, the one thing you can still do when you have no money is prep. Mm -hmm. You could be there on a Saturday and Sunday if you work your job Monday through Friday and make it easy on yourself is my advocacy. And when I did this no first no budget feature, uh, it was based on the walk I took around my neighborhood. And I think I've mentioned this. So when I take a walk pretty much every night for some years, now you start to notice things differently because you're looking at it through the lens of the film. Right. Oh, this would be a cool angle. Or here's a character under the bridge, and if I could get a little higher up, now they're going to look smaller and, you know, a little dangerous, like this thing's hovering over them, et cetera. So I think that's really a key element for, for filmmaking, you know? I absolutely agree with you. And, you know, it's interesting because um, the you know for a lot of people, uh, me included, sometimes a, an idea stem from something like a title. 
and um, yep. or something like just a simple seed of a scene, right? Um, I spoke uh, with Matt, uh, the CEO of Heavy Metal, about this on the show one time. It could be, you know, you could have an idea for a, a sort of a, a, an amorphous kind of um, concept for a film, but you don't have any ideas or characters or scenes or anything or even a genre in mind. And then you go to the coffee store and you see uh, or a coffee shop and you see an interaction between a customer and a barista. Yep. And now all of a sudden that interaction between the, the barista and the customer becomes the seed from which your entire film is then born. Absolutely. I think it's fascinating with human beings that you sit and you have this little idea. And I've always thought it would be a really cool I don't know if I, you know, make a commercial for being a filmmaker almost, but you would be walking along and all of a sudden you see this fuse on the ground that's lit. It's just, right? I mean, like in the old West, <laughs> they're going to blow up the bridge or something like that. And you just see this and it goes through the coffee shop and around. And then you, you know, see the, you know, a, an accident with the cars that goes under that. And, but humans will will do that, and they'll take a thread, and they'll be intrigued about a mystery. Uh, what's fascinating is the greatest mystery is their own lives, and our own lives. You know the way we live it. But we want to we want to make sense of that mystery. Human beings have an ex you know why is that why why do you think that is and. And um, I was reading a very good book called, uh, I think it's called Homo Sapiens, but a guy named Harari, and it was a very popular book in the New York Times uh, bestseller list, I think a couple years or something. Mm -hmm. But he said the essential beginning of language was um, constructed for gossip. And he, he, he put it out there in a very kind of... Um, you know, it's a provocative thing to say because it sounds like it diminishes the observation. But what's fascinating is, you know, it's Cameron and Michael getting together and going, hey, that Neanderthal over there, do you think we could trust him? You know, and because is he going to cheat us on the hunt? Is right. he going to give us our fair share? Uh, is he coming in and stealing from us? Uh, right. And it, it goes back and, and, and oh, do you think she'd be a good mate? You know, I mean, and to keep the family together because a unit survives solo solo uh, individuals died quickly so you you had gossip and i thought it was a fascinating observation because filmmaking is gossip it just happens to be permanent <laughs> in some odd way you know okay so here i'm going to i'm going to hit you with one of you ready okay uh, let me formulate this uh, 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 cynicism is the mother of observation. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's actually a good one. <laughs> Don't be so surprised. <laughs> no, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm not I'm not surprised you came up with a good one. I'm I'm surprised that the juxtaposition there of a uh, cynicism with uh is the mother of uh, mother of observation, correct? Yeah, that's yeah. Because listen, but you just were talking about how Gossip was the reason that language is, was invented. Yeah, yeah. Was the same thing, and cynicism is the mother of observation. And then you wrapped it up by saying, "In filmmaking, is basically gossip. It's just permanent." Well, you know, I mean, look, where does art come from? Where does where does any film that anyone makes come from? It comes from some sort of cynical something or other, whether it's Conflict. something you look at or something. Conflict. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, observation either of the world or internally or something like that it comes from a place of of uh, uh what can only be described as the 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 purity of artistic cynicism yeah no and i think there i think there is weight in that because if you look at it a number of uh, people observe that most of the time human beings spend their brain and their inner thoughts are negative so much of the time, more than the positive ones. Mm -hmm. You actually have to train your brain to ignore the negativity to stay on a positive track. And I think that there is merit in that, that indeed that cynicism and the idea of conflict in ourselves and with others, it also has a, a, a so much observational uh, history about film is there 
where someone said, well, nobody will ever make a film about a Boy Scout walking old lady across the street unless he mugs her at the other side. <laughs> <All right? laughs> because there is no conflict. And even in a film about goodness and goodness triumphing, there should be enough um, hardship and conflict and uh, goals that obstruct and that's the that goes back to classical film theory and the what's the book uh the journey i think is what it's called uh, where it's the struggle and the classical uh fables uh, uh of uh, struggle so yep. i think your i think your cynicism cynicism is the mother of observation is got some worthwhile components to ground itself and anchor itself in i think you you hit one out of the park there. <laughs> you did too with the emotional creative metric. <laughs> uh, <laughs> listen, Ron Purdy says, I feel like everything I write now is geared toward not being on a set and needing to shoot on Zoom. And I, I want to call this out because um, you actually have a brand new thing that you talked to me about a little bit today. Uh, because, you know, Zoom, yes, it is a perfect solution for filmmakers. Um, uh, especially in these times because these COVID quarantine projects can be made using it. Um, but you have once again gone way outside the box and you've started messing with animation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, this is something you knew nothing of other than the fact that you liked watching it and you were curious about it before you got into this, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, I never really did animation. I did a little... Adobe After Effects, uh, I'm pretty good on that intermediate level, but I, it's more manipulating images for some kind of uh, expression or you know, uh, visual effects. Right. But no, yeah, animation's a whole other world, and uh, it's uh, very fascinating to do. And uh, so when you and I started talking about it, I've actually got one. I'm working to finish the first three minutes. It's called... Um, uh, it's a series. I actually have a comic book on it. I have a script on it. The low-budget film that I did called Into the Flames is on that little ecosystem. And the inherent premise is there are a bunch of guys, and I wrote another script on it that's had a couple, um, couple well-known companies. I submitted it. And it started off with that script and it's basically about a bunch of guys in their 50s and his nephew shows up you know you can picture zach efron and and the the uh the uncle is john goodman so there we got a little tone right and what they do is the wife basically says to he and his friends who are all in the band you know and they're all lifelong friends you got to go clean out that storage container on the driveway or I'm going to kick all your asses, basically. So they go out, they clean it out, they open the bass drum. And there's like 350 pounds of hashish in the bass drum that they forgot about. So on this one night, they go, we got to sell this. We could make a lot of money. <laughs> and it all goes to hell, right? And that was the first script I wrote. I mean, there's stuff like naked yoga in there. And, you know, I mean, like... <laughs> Koi pond fish biting people on the neck, and I mean it's. Okay, wait a minute, there's competition for baby Yoda now. There's baby Yoda. <laughs> it's it's really like nutty, and um, that became the start of this kind of little ecosystem. And I said, well, I could do some comics, so I did some comics, just to kind of get a feel for it, the attitude, and the natural extension was animation. Yeah, and I tried it last. Uh, about five or six months ago uh, with character animator, Adobe character animator, which I found not very good um, for me. So I started this uh, new software and it's really taken off well. And um, I'm going to caution you not to say the software just because we don't want to necessarily officially endorse anything. At yeah. No, no, no. I was just telling you the one I didn't use, not the one I am right. using. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but what's amazing is how long have you been sitting with this new software? Uh, I'd say about six weeks. Six weeks, and you've just got you've just now got a, a three minute piece just about done. And I hope that when you're ready, you'll come and uh, and premiere some stuff. We'll do a world premiere. Absolutely, before. love to share it. But and, uh, then, and I want to I want to tell you one thing interesting is 
if you want to practice doing some filmmaking, what's uh, the 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 same qualities of writing, tonality, timing, framing, um, the choreography and blocking. Uh, uh, granted, a lot of it's in a two D world, but you work in a two D world ultimately. So, and there's limitations on the faces, how they can turn, obviously, to some degree, certainly at my skill level, which is beginning, basically. But at the same time, you are working with all those other elements that when you are making a film, look at how many people have gone from uh, doing a Toy Story or one of the major animations into live action. More so than one expects uh, over the last decade, maybe, right? Absolutely. So there's some merit there to a broader sense of the indie brigade and educational uh, merits. Just well, yeah. yeah, and and I really want to talk about and uh, hopefully you'll come back again next week so we can absolutely. But because um, we're gonna have to wrap it up here because we got David's show coming up in 15. You got minutes. it. But it's interesting because uh, even just after we spoke today and you said you're a beginner, you said, "Well, I'll send you a link to what I'm working on in a couple hours," and I was assuming a link for part of the three minute piece you were working on. But uh, as a beginner who clearly doesn't know what the hell you're doing at all, <laughs> in 55 fucking minutes, you sent me this thing that I could not stop laughing about. So <laughs> to load it up tonight. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and uh, I figured we would show everybody because, um, uh, you know, you did the, you've only been sitting with the software for about six weeks at your own admittance. And, now here you go in a couple of hours you i literally not even i don't even think it was an hour you sent me this um and it's it's just as funny as hell so uh, i'm, I'm really glad see. that you uh, appreciate that and i had to definitely uh uh thank joe as well in my own inimitable way <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, actually, you pronounced it wrong. It's blame Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't going to steal your thunder there, you know. So I just uh, I thought I'd let you have the first uh, blame game there. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm going to get this on screen. It's going to take a second because I have to do it a little differently. So give me one moment and. Romero, so the day you were telling me that you're in makeup for four hours before the show. Well, you prick, you missed the tiny hair on the top of your head, and now you look like a friggin' hippie. I'm just saying that it's all Joe's fault. <laughs> yeah, go fuck yourself. <laughs> And, you know, once again, just <laughs> when that came through, it was at a pretty emotional point in my day, and there was a lot of stuff going on, and there was a lot of crazy shit happening. And I watched that, and I went from sort of like zero headroom to just laughing hysterically. And, and Becky looked at me like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" <laughs> I showed it to her. We just laughed for a good ten minutes. And, you know, what, what laughter can do for the soul is amazing. And I got to tell you, that was just sheer brilliance that you sent that. So I'm uh, really glad you enjoyed it. And, and you know, it's, it's funny <laughs> because you literally did that in no time at all. So, I mean, yeah. the point here is that, in, and I'd like to really dive deep into this next week with you a little bit. Sure. Um, there are a million ways to get your creative out there. And, and by, again, your own admittance, you started with a script that is now a comic book. And now you're working on an animation for it. And uh, you have essentially created a larger piece of intellectual property, which has been a theme in the Indie Brigade for about a season and a half now. That's it. You know, that's it. And that's it. So I thank you so much, my friend and brother. Thank you. From afar. I, I love you and I miss you. And I can't wait to you, buddy. be here with you. And um, thank you again so much for tonight. Absolutely. I, an honor as uh, always. I really appreciate it. Thank you and Joe. And, uh, I'm still good in ear to ear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could leave you guys laughing, and that's a good sign. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll talk to you in a couple of days. Okay, guys. Thank See you, you. Bye. Bye. You. Bye. <laughs> Man, there we go. Right? Well, listen, everybody, stick around. Uh, we've got um, – you want to show the video one more time before the end? We have time, right?
okay. Um, un momento, por favor. You know, he's working on his French. I'm working on my Spanish, so don't hate. Uh, and thank you, Michael. That, that was phenomenal. Let me get the video going. And actually, before we do that, David. Whoa, you just scared hey, me. David. David. Hello, fellas. How are you? Good. How's it going? Excellent. Very well. Very well. You're going to be coming on shortly with Dan Parent and Judy Norton. David yes. will be on in about 10 minutes. So I uh, hate to rush it, David, but bye. We'll see you in 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. Here we go with the video again. And then.
right, we'll make this quick, Joe. What happened? <laughs> what I miss? I don't know. I thought you said my mic was something. No, not at all. I said uh, that was just it just gets me every time, man. So absolutely, it freaking you know, the heart strings. No, we got six minutes. You got stuff to do, so let's make this quick. Are you ready for the sign out? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, hold on. Oh, first of all, uh, uh, yeah, go go ahead because I'm gonna play the world premiere because it's so freaking cool, and then the sign off the regular. Okay. Well, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in tonight, Joe. I love you as always. Uh, thank love you for your hard work. Uh, everybody who tuned in and stuck with us, make sure you stick around for the end of the night with David Lee Madison. He's got an amazing show coming up in just about five minutes. And uh, Richard Grieco, I absolutely love you with all my heart, man. And I'm so proud of you. Michael Mandeville, I love you. And I uh, thank you for spending so much time with us and talking about this important stuff for everybody. And uh, as always, this has been a world premiere event here on Romero Pictures Indie Brigade. Fuck off till next time. To be a fringe filmmaker means we don't do it for them. We do it for ourselves. To be an outlaw on the fringe means we'll die before we fail. Be an outlaw.
Mr. Ridgely. How are you, sir? Good. How are you, brother? Ooh, out of breath. Why is that? Had three minutes in between shows. Oh, I gotcha. I gotcha. <laughs> and what did you do in those three minutes? Um, took off my hat and did my hair. Okay. Okay. No, I got I a drink, tell. actually. <laughs> so uh, what I miss tonight? What I miss? Hi, Sean. Sean, Sean. There's Sean. You you missed a lot. You missed. Uh, let's see, we had Richard Grieco in the world mm -hmm. premiere or the premiere of his video. Yeah, I just seen that. Awesome. And, and Michael Mandeville again. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's the gist of it. Awesome, awesome. I apologize for not being at pre-show. Uh, I had a meeting tonight with uh, exhibitors who are looking to show. Uh, wits end in theaters, so I had a uh, sorry about that. Yay, what's so, Joe? You are one of five people now on the planet who has seen wits end, and you and I have not said a word to each other about it. I'm dying to know what you thought of the movie. You're putting me on the spot here. I mean, yes. it, it was freaking phenomenal, and I'm a manly man. So mm -hmm. for, for, for me to say this and to say that it, it, it brought true emotion and I almost shed a tear, that, that's really saying a lot. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's one of those movies that uh, uh, it was unbelievably difficult to film. Now that you've seen it, you can probably understand why. Well, and, uh, on that note, it, it's yeah. one of the reasons I live in Florida. Yes. <laughs> Smart man. And uh, and uh, it, the trailer went out on Wednesday, and like two thousand people seen it already. So I'm excited about that. And all, uh, we sent out a press release, and over seven hundred different outlets picked it up. So uh, super excited. So everybody, keep an eye out for Wits End, which is going to be in select theaters on July 10th, and on VOD July 17th. Man, just look at that movie poster. Yes. So now that I hoard my soul out, I can get to uh, the business at hand. How was uh, how was uh, Judy and Dan in the pre-show? Were they upset that I wasn't there? Uh, no, they were fine. I I think I may have taken them off guard by it being me and not you. But it's like, <laughs> well, they're like you know, we were expecting a goofy looking guy, but you know, we got they got a goofier looking guy. We got an incredibly handsome and suave uh, guy. <laughs> well, thank you. Was, yeah. Um, and, and just so you know, uh, Miss Judy Norton is in the green room. So oh, she is already. Just, okay. um, just letting you know. Okay. Well, um, as everybody who watches this show knows, I'm walking on cloud nine tonight because I am the biggest Walton's geek on the face of the earth. Now, I didn't say she was ready. I just said she was in the green room. Well, I got you. I got you. I'm not going to pull her up yet. <laughs> okay. Let her, let her, let her. Get a chance to relax and soak in the stupidity of my show. Uh, you want to do some movies that you should watch while you're on quarantine time? Absolutely. Okay. Seeing we are all stranded at home, not being able to live our lives, here are some films that you should check out while you are on quarantine. I'm sure you saw this one, Joe. It's Steven Spielberg's first film, Duel, with I, Dennis Weaver. I have seen that. What did you think of this movie? Uh, see, when I saw it, it was probably 15, 20 years ago, and I didn't get it at first. It, it took multiple viewings. You know what's great about that movie is that when you watch it, where you could keep yourself up. I'm goofy looking. Uh, you could see where Steven Spielberg's ultimate talent was coming from. And uh, of course, Dennis Weaver was like a major star at the time. Another movie you guys should see. This is a classic blockbuster, but not everybody has seen it. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but Lawrence of Arabia. 
who hasn't seen that, a any film student should see that. With Peter O'Toole, a sweeping, epic masterpiece of a movie. If you want to be a filmmaker or if you just love film or if you just want to be lost in a movie, I think it's close to three hours long, but it doesn't feel that long. Peter O'Toole is masterful, beautifully shot film. I think it won seven Academy Awards. Sit back and watch Lawrence of Arabia. And one more. This is a guilty pleasure film. I'm not sure if you've ever seen this, Joe. But in the 1980s, right after Silver Bullet, I became like a really huge Gary Busey fan. I don't know why. I loved him in Silver Bullet as the big goofy uncle who uh, protects uh, wheelchair-bound Corey Haim. Yes. And after, after seeing him in Silver Bullet, uh, he came out with a movie uh, with Henry Silver called Bulletproof. Did you ever see this movie? I have not seen that. Bulletproof is a guilty pleasure if you want two hours of Gary Busey in a shoot 'em up cop movie from the 80s, just acting like a big buffoon. This is the movie for you. Check out Bulletproof. So is Gary Busey being Gary Busey? He's being, it's Gary Busey being Gary Busey. And now his son is being Gary Busey. That's very true. And actually, he's better at Gary Busey than Gary Busey was. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I'm apologizing for for taking a momentary pause to drink. I've been Joe the last like 72 hours. If I have slept four hours in those 72 hours, I'd be shocked. I just am running constantly. Got a whole bunch of stuff going on. So if I'm off my game tonight, I'm sure nobody noticed because I suck every week. But if I'm off my game tonight, especially, I apologize ahead of time. Huh. George and I call that an average day. <laughs> you guys call that a Friday. Yeah. Uh, so is Miss Norton ready for our silly shenanigans? I will wait for her to give me a thumbs up. And Miss Norton, are you ready to come on? Well, don't don't shoot her right up because I got. Well, I'm not going to. I just need her to get. Yeah. Let's see. Ready. All right. She's ready. Here you All go, right. David. Uh, our, our first guest tonight. Uh, played one of the most iconic characters in television history, Mary Ellen Walton, on one of the most iconic television shows in television history, The Waltons. She has an amazing career in film and television. Everybody, let's welcome Miss Judy Norton. Hi, Judy. How are Hi. you? Hi. I'm fine. How are you? First of all, I'm going to, if I, if I stutter or if I geek <laughs> out or anything, Please forgive me ahead of time. I actually was blessed to interview. Uh, I interviewed Jimmy Carter once. I interviewed uh, George Clooney once, but I never got to interview a Walton. So I'm about to really? like. I'm besides yeah. myself with. Uh, well, there's a lot of us to choose from, so <laughs> you just found me first, huh? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I seek you out because you're actually my favorite. Aw, thanks. Yes. And let me tell you how this all started. Back uh, when I was a kid in the 70s, of course, your show was super popular. And I loved it when I was a kid. And then I hadn't seen it for like since the 70s, to be honest with you, because I grew up in New York City and we had antenna TV and there was three or four, you know, there's channel, there's NBC, ABC, CBS and like two locals. And for some bizarre reason, they would always replay Little House on the Prairie, but they would never replay the Waltons. And then stop laughing at me, Joe. And then when, then when this whole uh, quarantine thing started, uh, I love my wife dearly. She's a beautiful, lovely woman, but she snores like a chainsaw. I mean, I literally lay in bed. I'm like a cartoon character. You know, you put the pillow in one ear and out the other. And every night I'm laying there like, oh, my God, is she ever going to stop? And apparently the Hallmark Channel, every night from 11 p.m. all the way till 5 o'clock in the morning, plays the Waltons. Wow. And I sit there like a, like a mental patient every night watching four <laughs> to five hours of the Waltons. And the funny part is, is that I, after watching it the first time, I started remembering it from the seventies. So wow. I'm sorry for my rant. So you probably know it better than I do at this point. Cause a lot of those episodes I haven't seen in forever. So <laughs> 
I know. I swear at this point, like the fans know the episodes and the characters better than I do. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because my wife, uh, I have my big 50th birthday coming up soon. And uh, one, one of my last big birthdays, she arranged for me to stay in the A Christmas Story house. And now she's arranged for us to have a Walton's house in West Virginia. Yeah. Have you been there yet? Yes. Um, a bunch of the cast was there for the opening of it at John and Olivia's Bed and Breakfast. Yeah. It's, it is surreal because they have re they literally have recreated the living room and the kitchen, you know, downstairs. So you walk in there and it's like, for us, it was so bizarre. It was like, Oh my God, this is like nine years of our life, you know? <laughs> and, and, and then upstairs they've, they haven't, they've sort of the, the bedrooms aren't really John Boyce is probably the mm -hmm. closest mm -hmm. um, to how it looked on the show. The others are not so much, but they've got, you know, mom and daddy's room and the girls room and the boys room and the grandparents room. And um, those, you know, so those aren't quite so much the style of furniture. Yeah. But but the downstairs, it was just weird. And we were the first ones to stay, you know, like, well, so they said, I'm sure the owners stayed. But, you know, we were like the first actual guests to stay in the house the first weekend. And we literally like when they kind of left us there, it was so bizarre. It was like, they've left us alone in the house. <laughs> and it was so strange because when we were filming, we were never alone in those sets because we were always working. So there was always other crew people around. And, you know, even if it was like lunch and they weren't using that set, there were other people around. So that was this very surreal thing to go, we're alone in the house. <laughs> you know, this is like, the first time we sat and actually had a real honest to goodness meal at that table that wasn't props and food that we'd been eating for three hours that was cold and congealed. Yeah, I mean, it was just like to spend that time, you know, in there and we go, oh, well, these stairs are different and, and that wasn't quite there. And, you know, and somebody went, well, wasn't that? And like the owners were like, well, we tried to recreate. So if you noticed anything that's different, it was like, are you kidding me? It's been 40 years. What do you expect me to remember? You know, it's like, <laughs> I, you know, I, they knew more because they'd been studying and freeze framing, you know, segments of the of the place to try and recreate it. And it was just it was fascinating. But they it had ceilings, mm -hmm. which are set. <laughs> then, yeah. just, they were all on a soundstage. So the walls moved and. There was no ceiling. It was just, you know, rigging for lights. And when we went up the stairs, we went around a corner and then we all had to cram into a little landing because there was nowhere else to go. And then if we were all running down the stairs, we all crammed in the, and then popped out of, you know. So to actually be in, a, you know, an actual physical house was just so strange. So it go. You will love it. It's just like it's the best. <laughs> yes, I'm sure I'm going to geek out and I, I'll say to my <laughs> wife, uh, you know, good night. John Boy. Before <laughs> and before this interview is over, please don't take it the wrong way. But I'm the last thing I'm going to say to you is good night, Mariel. Okay. 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 It's, it's like it's been like a lifelong. That'll time. be different. <laughs> yes, yeah, you remember? It's like my my dearest friend is uh, Brian O'Holland from a movie called Clerks, and he had a very famous role called "I'm Not Even Supposed to Be Here Today." And literally everywhere we go, me and this poor bastard were out even either having lunch at at, at a diner or something. People just come up to him and go, I'm not even supposed to be here today. And and they all think it's like the first time he's ever heard it. So <laughs> so you know what? I'm not well, Marilyn Gigliotti from Clerks is a yes. friend of mine. So yes. if you haven't interviewed her, put her on your list. I'll I'll connect you guys. And you know, um Marilyn, as um one of the, you were talking Christmas story, Scotty Scott Schwartz. Schwartz. Yes. I so just did a show like two weeks ago. Okay. Cause I just did, uh, we did quarantine bunch together. Oh yes. 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 And if last week we had, seen, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. It's silly, but you know, there you go. It's the things we do during quarantine. <laughs> last week we had Keith Coogan on. Oh yeah. Yeah. Of course. I had, to, I had to geek out on, on the Waltons then. Yeah. And now, and now everybody who's fans of this show thinks I'm turning it into, you know, the Walton show. So I, <laughs> Uh, uh, I apologize to everybody for being a fanboy, but, uh, you know, it's my show, so you have to live with it. <laughs> well, so I'm not really the first Walton. No, 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 no. He wasn't a Walton. Uh, he was a cousin. Was his last name Walton? No. So I think then, it was Burton. 
Burton. Sorry. It was Rose Burton and it was her. Yeah. So, but he was kind of a. Dis- that's like, that's like saying Almanzo was an angle. It just, it's not really the truth. Uh, uh, shut up, Joe. Uh, I want to get to know you a little bit. So I see on, I see on Facebook that you ask like movie trivia questions. Mm-hmm. Are you like a big cinema fan or a big movie fan? Um, Yes and no. I mean, it's it's getting harder and harder for me to come up with things because I end up, you know, it's like I don't want to make it too obscure, but people know that, you know, the stuff that I know. And it, it started because uh, um, a publicist friend of mine uh, does publicity for the Hollywood Museum. Mm-hmm. And because of everything being shut down, they were supposed to be, you know, having different various events. And he's like, he said, I'm just trying to do things to engage people with the website while things are shut down or to remember the place. And so he was asking a lot of his clients and whatnot and actors he knew to do to record little trivia clips that mm-hmm. they would play on the website or to promote going to the website. And so he the first one that I did was bec- was this piece of trivia that he gave me about actresses who had done Max Factor commercial or, or print ads. And, you know, he's like, just do one recording with the question and then do a second one with the answer and we'll play them consecutive days or a few days apart or whatever. So just for the heck of it, I was like, I slapped it up on my social media as well. And people were like, oh, this is so much fun. You should do more. So then I'm like, okay, well, what the heck, you know? So every time I have to actually put makeup on and, you know, and brush my hair, I go, what can I record? <laughs> Cause trust me, you know, it's like, otherwise it's sweats and, you know, ponytails and, you know, you know so. if you're ever stuck, you could I am me because I am the king of you. Ah, okay. okay. Perfect. I know, you know, all that space in my brain that was supposed, <laughs> you know, was supposed to be for important stuff is literally Walton's and trivia. Well, yes, Walton's and or trivial and, Waltons. Yeah. yeah, it's actually like everything that was ever put on film. It's not just the wow. Waltons. It's very okay. Very, okay, very you scary. are my new resource because yes. Though, but people, I mean, I think sometimes they like it when they can get it, but they'll go, oh, that's too easy because they knew it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think they kind of like it when they, you know, when they know them. Yes. Yeah. The best trivia question of all time is two actors were killed by the Terminator, the Predator, and the Alien. And everybody only gets one of those two, of the, of those two actors, all right? All three of those? Yes. All three, all three characters have each killed two different actors. Wow. And everybody gets one very quickly, but they never get the other one. I haven't watched all three of those franchises, so I'm <laughs> I'm already out. <laughs> I do you know the answer, Joe? Let me think on it. Okay. You know, you and you're know, also I, whether whether you know I never know what sort of other things our fans like mm-hmm. you know, because it's it's interesting. Like I'll post different sorts of things, and sometimes people get really interested in a particular topic, but the majority of the time I find that they pretty much want to talk about the Waltons, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to know sometimes what other topics of interest appeal to them. Okay. I'm going to tie the Waltons in to my favorite movie of all time. And you're going to have to forgive me because sadly I I rushed to the show tonight. I wasn't able to prepare like I like to, I actually have a movie coming out next Friday and I'm like going absolutely crazy right now. So I apologize for not being as prepared as I usually am. But my favorite movie of all time was It's a Wonderful Life. Oh. And you guys got to work with George Bailey's mom, as I recall. Um, Beulah Bondi? Yeah, she played the, yeah. the, 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 the Walton who lived on the mountain yeah. who got upset Martin when they were trying yeah. to drive the road through it. Yeah. Well, and Ellen Corby was in it as well. Ellen Corby was in It's a Wonderful Life? Yes. She was the little lady who wanted to, when, when they had the run on the bank and yeah. everybody wanted all their money and she was the one. Oh, who she won on 1750? Yeah. But she, she took only wow. like a dollar and a half. It's like, well, I could get by with $3 or whatever. That's all her. right. Watch it again and look for her. You know, that's amazing now that you say that. That absolutely is her. And yeah. she had a couple of scenes, you know, in the bank. Yes, no, no. She actually has a really cool scene. And 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 the lady who played George Bailey's mom also played 
your aunt on the Waltons. So right. did you guys ever get a chance to, uh, you know, it's funny because when you guys filmed that in the early seventies, uh, it's a wonderful life hadn't taken off like mm -hmm. it has in the, in, in, in the last 30 years. Did, did they, were they aware of what that film was like becoming? You know, I don't really remember. Mm -hmm. I don't know when, when I first started watching, you know, like a lot of people, I have my Christmas tradition movies, you know, that I kind of watch every year at Christmas mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful life is, is one of those, but I don't remember when I started watching it sort of regularly. Yeah. It was, it was 1981 when NBC picked it up, like off, like out of a, a screen, you know, it wasn't popular. Wow. And NBC started playing it every Christmas and then TNT or TBS started playing it for like 24 hours at a time. And it became the, like the Christmas classic that it has become, uh, when, uh speaking of Ellen Kobe, uh, sh uh, you guys are doing the show. It was probably right in the heart of its popularity. And, uh, she was stricken with a stroke, uh, but she actually came back. Uh, and it was actually, one of the most heartfelt performances maybe in television yeah. history of somebody who just you clearly seen that she really wasn't up to you know uh, uh up to doing it her role anymore but she came back with such uh determination and you, it was really just an amazing thing to see that when she came back yeah it was i mean bravo to you know to the producers to bring her back because I, as far as I know, that was the first time they had had an, an actor or actress who'd actually, you know, I mean, well, now Patricia Neal had had a stroke, but she had, she was pretty well recovered by the time, you know, when we did um, the homecoming and she played our mom, you right. know, she was, you know, she had a little bit of um, not even a really a limp, but, you know, she, she had a, you know, we were warned as kids to be careful around her because she potentially wasn't solid on her, you know, on her pins. Um, you know, don't knock her over. <laughs> it'll it'll yeah. be bad. Um, but um, Ellen, yes, I mean, her whole right side was was paralyzed. And yes, she struggled for every, as you saw, for every word mm -hmm. that she said. And and she would get so frustrated because, you know, she she practiced and practiced and and then she couldn't, you know, and, and she'd get angry and, you know, it was, it was, but I mean, to me, it was like a lesson. It was like a master class in acting because mm -hmm. what she did with no words was more conveyed so much more than the majority of actors can do with a monologue. And, you know, I just looked at that and went, wow, you know, it's not about the words, you know? Yeah. And you know, what was great about it is that the, the, the directors of the show or, the, you know, the producers or whoever actually put the show together were smart enough to realize that she was able to uh, give wonderful, heartfelt performances uh, when she was paralyzed and couldn't speak. And it was really what she did with her facial expressions and with her eyes. Yeah. And uh, I remember there was one specific episode and I don't remember what she was trying to mutter. Like, uh, I, uh, I want, uh, you need guys to me. was the one that need yeah. me, right. Need me. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it was just what a wonderful, yeah. wonderful Perfect. episode. Yeah. And, 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 and as a fan and after watching it again, after all these years, uh, it seemed like you guys were kind of snake bitten there because you got Ellen back and you finished out, I guess, a season. And then the summer uh, after Ellen came back after having a stroke, Will Greer, Will Greer passed away, her husband on the show, Grandpa Walton. And uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit what it was like to come back to the show after losing like such a beloved cast member? Um, yeah, we, we lost him over hiatus. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we had some time to you know, absorb that and the producers had time to determine how they were going to deal with that when we came back. Um, and um, there was like a, a memorial out at Will Geerum has a theater that he, you know, basically founded and, you know, it's on property that he lived on for years in Topanga Canyon. And he was a huge like Shakespeare 
you know, um, performer and fan and whatnot. And so it's an outdoor, they don't do just Shakespeare, but it's like an outdoor theater that they do in the summer, classic, you know, theater, including a lot of Shakespeare. And there is a Shakespeare garden. Will was also, um, he had a degree in botany. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so he planted so much of what was growing there um, on that land in Topanga where the theater is. And he planted a Shakespeare garden. And I believe they had that. And, and his, um, I don't know whether it's his ashes, it's probably his ashes are actually, I think, um, in, in um, there's a monument or whatever there, a, a bust. And I believe his ashes are scattered. Um, some of them in the Shakespeare garden. I could be remembering this totally wrong, but that's what I remember. And his, so, um, his daughters still run the theater. Ellen Gear did a couple of episodes of the Waltons. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she's wonderful. She's, you know, an actress you see on stuff all the time. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so when we came back, they had decided, I guess, rather than making it that he had just died and, um, you know, having that emotional upheaval for all of us. Um, you know, they did the episode where it was like six months after and we all went up on the mountain to his grave site, grave site. And, you know, and tended the grave site and ta everybody talked to him. And, um, and we had, um, we very rarely shot off of the lot at Warner Brothers, but um, every once in a while we'd go up to a place called Fraser Park, which was an you know, hour and a half, two hours away or something. And and if when we really needed expansive big mountain um, shots, that's where we went. So for for that up where you could really see, um, that's where they did Mary Ellen's wedding. You know, that's where the airplane landed and took off in the air mailman and things like that. Um, so we were up there, and um, you know, I that's. I, I don't remember much else about shooting that episode, but I distinctly remember us all being up there and sharing, you know, that moment and having only had having not been that far removed from it personally. I mean, that's the thing when you've when you've when you've had that kind of history with people, it's like for real, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's not it you know those types of incidents. It, there wasn't a lot of you know, doing your homework as an actor, you know, you lived your homework and, you know, the relationships were, and the feelings were all very real for all of us. And as I recall on that particular episode, uh, they had a flashback scene, I think to a previous episode where the grandpa and the grandma were sitting on top of the mountain talking to each mm -hmm. other about, or reminiscing about, you know, when they were young, just perfectly well done that episode. Uh, if this is a sore topic, you don't have to answer. But when Richard Thomas left the show, mm -hmm. uh, were you guys pissed at him? No. No? Uh, no, not that I know of, you know. I mean, I think it might have been harder for the producers. Mm -hmm. um, I think Earl Hamner, who created the show, I don't know if he was pissed, but, I mean, it was difficult because the show was based on his life and the character of John Boy, so I think right. he was disappointed. But mm -hmm. Richard had signed a five-year contract, he honored that contract and he just chose not to renew the contract. So it wasn't like it was some big, you know, he left over money or, you know, some contract negotiation. No, it was all, you know, he, he's wonderful. We all loved him. And I mean, mostly we just missed him, you know, it was just really that talk about a sad episode, you know, like when, when we knew is like, you know, there were those moments where it's like, Oh my goodness, this is like the last scene I'm filming with him. You know, and, and so it was a very emotional episode for us to film. And, um, you know, we missed him. We missed the character. Uh, missed him. Richard was always lovely to work with, you know. Um, and it was great when we did the reunion specials and he came back and, you know. It just seemed like uh – I remember even back in the seventies when I was watching a show as a kid, it just seemed like a, a, like a weird choice because at the time, I think the show was like in the top five. It was one of the biggest shows in the country. Yeah. And, uh, uh, a young guy who's a star of a top five show, it's not something that you get every day. So it just seemed like a, it was seemed like a, a, a weird choice. And well, Richard will sometimes talk about, you know, the sort of hubris of youth, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> 
And, um, you know, so whether he ever had moments of what the heck was I thinking, but he's mm -hmm. gone on to have a very steady career. Oh, absolutely. So it has not been, you know, something that, you know, it's not like, oh, he went into obscurity then and nobody ever heard from him again. He's never stopped working. So I think, you know, it wasn't a bad choice for him. He, you know, he he went on and did other things. It was like when Michael Learned left the show um, a couple seasons later and she went right into another series called Nurse and won, you know, two or three more Emmys for that show. And, you know, so it's sometimes it's just... You know, I think he, he felt like it was time to move on. You know, he'd done everything he could with the character of John Boy and he wanted other. I mean, I get it from the standpoint of the fans and like for those of us who, you know, decided, you know, who chose to stay. It was like, well, wait a minute. You know, you left the party, you know, yeah, no, 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 I, I know I, I get, you know, the the desire as a performer to, you know, to kind of go been there, done that. And where's my next artistic challenge? No, I mean, and I totally get that, and I totally respect Richard Thomas. He's on my favorite, my my favorite current TV show is Billions, and he's a, a reoccurring. Uh, oh, is he? Uh, okay, yeah, I've, uh, I've only yeah. seen early episodes of that. You know, so. Yeah, and it was just that he was like uh, one of the at the time one of the most be him and probably Fonzie were the two most uh, beloved characters on TV at that time, and uh, to walk away from that, it was just I don't know, strange to me. But what the hell do I know? Um, <laughs> uh, is it Robert Reitman that took over the role? Do I have the Whiteman. right name? Whiteman, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, when they decided to recast John Boy, were you guys like, uh, when I say you guys, I mean John Boy's brothers and sisters. Like, mm -hmm. were you guys like, what the hell are you thinking? Or Yeah, kind of. You know, it yeah. was sort of, um, you know, it was just, it, Richard was a difficult act to follow. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure what, um, what went into the casting choice, um, you know, whether they were trying to, I mean, obviously, I mean, initially the character was lying in a coma in a bed. So whether they went, well, let's try and get someone who looks like him lying flat on his back with his head wrapped up. Um, I don't know that he looked like him even then, but, um, you know, it just, he seemed, his energy was so different than Richard's that that I think was difficult for us because we were used to, you know, the high energy that Richard always had and his portrayal of John Boy. And, and Robert was just, Bob was just a very different sort of actor, a very different sort of energy, very kind of low key. So it was just odd when you are expecting something you know, a relationship that you're used to used, right. with, you know, in terms of, well, Mary Ellen's going to play, you know, Mary Ellen and John Boy had a lot of scenes together and there was mm -hmm. always a certain energy between them. And, and it was kind of like, you know, you want to be combative and the person's going, mm -hmm. no. you know, and you're like, what, what, come on, get yeah. in here with me, you know? And, oh, well, that's what made Mary Ellen and John yeah. Boy work was that like, uh, that brother or sister, or like, you know, when you, when you walk by, you smack each other in the head kind of approach that you guys had, but you know, it's funny. He brought a subtlety to the role and a charm that I think people overlooked. Mm. And I don't know if he did that on purpose. Like, did he do that because John boy was damaged from being at war? And, you know, you know, I always felt like uh, that poor guy was thrown into, uh, uh, into a role that was just like, you know, there was nothing that he could have done that was going to win anybody over, you know, it's like yeah. if somebody was asked to play Fonzie, you know, it just was never going to work again. Yeah. It's, it's a definitely a, a, a sort of a thankless task. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, what's great about the ones John boy leaves. And then I think you guys go on for five or six seasons without him, and the show doesn't skip a beat. And you that's know, a test well, yeah. We did four, four seasons, mm -hmm. you know, so he left. And then two seasons later, I think, Michael left, you know, played our mom. And then the mm -hmm. next year, I think Ralph left. So by the last season, it's like the inmates were running the zoo, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just the kids were left. It's like, Hey, <laughs> nobody's home, but us. <laughs> and, and, and you know, what's great. Uh, I think you're, uh, you only missed one episode in the entire series that you were in, right? Is that? Yeah. 
Well, what happened was um, it was at the point that um, my character was pregnant. Okay. And there was a point where there was an episode. They didn't know when the episode where Mary Ellen had the baby was going to air. And there was mm -hmm. some question about which week. So there was a possible episode that could air before mm -hmm. or after. So they went, we can't have you in the episode because we don't know whether you should be pregnant or not. So right. it was sort of a safety episode that could go either way. I don't remember ultimately which way it went, but basically that was why I wasn't in the episode was because they didn't know if I needed to be pregnant or not. Tell me a little bit about what it was like when you guys all were uh, reconvened in the nineties for the, for the TV movies, like the Walton's Easter and, and the Walton wedding and all those great things that you guys did later on. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, there was a lot of, I mean, it was all wonderful for us to get together again. And, you know, it, it, I always thought of it like when people have school reunions or whatever. I mean, you get back and you just yap about, you know, which we would do all the time too. Oh, yeah, you know, we'd get together and we'd just reminisce about our lives. And, you know, we, we always can just kind of pick up where we left off in terms of our personal lives. It's, it's, it is like family. Like, you know, it doesn't matter if we haven't seen each other for five years, 10 years. It's like, boom, you're right back in there. Um, but we actually got to, you know, create, like redo the work, which was really special to go, hey, we're back, not just visiting and reminiscing about our lives, but we're bringing these characters back to life. So that part of it was like really, really cool. The, the downside was that there was some, I don't know exactly what was going on, like with the powers that be who made some of the decisions about it, but it was sort of like, for most of us, we had virtually nothing to do. You know, it was kind of like we were window dressing, which was a little, you know, it's kind of like the show was the Waltons. <laughs> and yet, you know, at least a couple of those episodes, you know, the episode where John Boy got married, it's like we were barely there. We showed up for the wedding, you know, so it was a little like all these characters that the audience didn't know. Yeah. Watched us for years, didn't know, became the primary story point. You know, and it was like, where's the family? You know, mm -hmm. and we, we heard about that a lot. Or what happened to like missing kids? You know, where did John Curtis go? And all of a sudden I have two other kids after I supposedly had an accident and couldn't have children. Now I've got two kids, but John Curtis is missing. Ben and right. Cindy had two kids. And all of a sudden they talked about one of them having died or something, but the other one just obviously evaporated. And we told, you know, we said, hey, there's other kids. And, and the, you know, somebody, some producer was like, oh, they won't know. Nobody will notice. I'm like, no, you're wrong about that because we get asked about that all the time. You know, yeah. it's like you, you can't, fans are not stupid. You know, the loyal yes. fans know everything that went on. So, so that was, that was the downside of those specials. But I mean, not that for a moment did I regret having the opportunity to get back with those people and, you know, that I love and, and, and actually work together again. I just wish the storylines had been, you know, a little stronger revolving around the whole family. Yes. Maybe you guys should, you should hook up with Hallmark and, and get another Walton's movie made. I know it seems like a no brainer, but right. you know, <laughs> yeah. they have no I, brains if they don't do it. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. I, I, you know, all right. I am sorry. Cause I know you are a super accomplished actress and you've done, directing and producing and i'm here chewing your ear up for your entire episode <laughs> about the waltons i apologize tell us a little bit about working on millennium ah um well i spent um 10 years living in canada because i'm half canadian and um while i was up there there was a whole bunch of these really cool shows like stargate and millennium and um beggars and choosers and things that i got to work on while i was up there and um i mean i was you know from the um, Alien franchise, huge, you know, fan of, um, oh gosh, now I've spaced on the actor's name um, from Millennium. Sigourney Wiener? Oh, no. Lance Henriksen. Lance Henriksen, thank you. Yes. Um, so I was really excited to, I did two episodes actually of Millennium and, um, and that was like, that was like really cool to, you know, to work on that. So to do some of these other types of shows that were Although the characters I played on Millennium were one was a coroner, one was a, you know, a mom. So they weren't that far removed. But, you know, some of the other shows I did up there 
um, you know, the sort of corporate, you know, a la Gloria Allred, you know, um, Beverly Hills attorney that I played on Beggars and Choosers was like a little bit further removed from um, from my Walton days, but a heck of a lot of fun to play. <laughs> Here's why I, I, this is what they call in basketball an alley-oop. This is why I asked you this question. Lance Henriksen is actually one of the answers to the two of the two actors who were killed by the alien ah. predator and uh, the Terminator. Okay. Lance Henriksen was killed by uh, Alien in the movie uh, Alien. Right. I think there's like 20 of them. But, yeah. He was killed in uh, uh, Terminator uh, in the first Terminator movie. And oh. he was killed by the uh, the Predator in Alien versus Predator. Oh. So most people forget that part. And the other actor is the late Bill Paxton. Mm. Did you ever get to work with Bill? I did not. Mm. He was now, a wonderful, wonderful actor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really cool people cycled through the Walton. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I was watching just the other night, and I was blown away to see you guys were directed uh, in an episode by Ivan Dixon. Is it the Ivan Dixon from Hogan's Heroes? Uh-huh. He directed a few episodes. Yeah, he was great to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and another thing that really blows my mind is how many crossover people were, because the show's kind of even though uh, chronologically they were sixty years apart, but for some reason they kind of always hold. Uh, people think of them hand in hand as Waltons in Little House on the Prairie, mm -hmm. and it always blows my mind to see how many writers and directors and even actors crossed over from episodes of the Waltons. And to Little House in the Prairie. I mean, uh, the Mr. Edwards, who's one of the you know the most iconic characters on uh, 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 on Little House in the Prairie. I've seen him on the first couple episodes of The Waltons. He was, uh, I think, a blacksmith or something. Yeah, a Victor French. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and a little girl who the Gotsies uh, adopt, the little blonde girl. She okay. was on Little House on the Prairie. Okay. I think she was uh, uh, Elizabeth's. But I see, yeah, is... Amy, Amy Godsey. Yeah. Yeah. She was uh, uh, also on the show. So I'm, I'm before I sit here and I talk to you about useless Walton's information, and you start to dis <laughs> and you start to dislike me. I'm going to thank you very, very much for joining us tonight. Is there? Uh, can you tell our fans out there where they can find you on what social media platforms? And, and um, I am on um, Facebook. Uh, you just you look for my my kind of fan page where there's a picture of Mary Ellen wearing a straw hat. And that is me, and that uh, that's the one where I pretty much interact with people and uh, post that trivia stuff and different things about the Waltons. And then I'm on Twitter. Um, you, again, look for me. I think there's a shot again of Mary Ellen with the straw hat. I'm on Instagram uh, at official Judy Norton, uh, where I do not have a Mary Ellen straw hat on. It's just me looking like a grown up. Um, but you can find me those three places, and I do interact with people. And I just launched um, a YouTube channel where I'm um, doing a combination of, um, of things, including some behind the scenes um, commentary about some of the Walton episodes. So find my YouTube channel and you can hear me talk about some of what I remember about filming specific scenes from um, iconic Walton episodes. And uh, there you go. And if you're looking for um, something to watch, we're going to switch gears um, during uh, the, all this shut in and quarantine. Um, my most recent film called Nowhere to Hide, which is a psychological thriller where um, I get stalked or I'm going crazy. And, you know, it's one of the two. So watch the movie. Find out it streams for free on 2B TV. So um, check it out. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> Nowhere to hide. Is that what? OK. No. Yeah, you just look for my face on the cover. It's like shattered glass and and um, picture me looking will, pretty scared. I will tell you tonight when I'm laying next to my snoring wife, I will <laughs> not be watching the Waltons. I will be watching that film that you just, ah, just cool. Said. All right. So, and then you, you can let me know, you know, if you figured out what was going to happen and, you know, what you thought. Absolutely. I want to send you a, a link with a private password to see my new film, Wits End. I would love to hear what you think. Cool. About and it. what did what did you, you say your film, produce, direct it, act? I, 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 I usually write and direct, but this is the first film that I'm actually in front of the camera 
and uh and uh i don't know we'll see how it goes comes out on uh july 10th and then on vo it's called theater on demand now on july 17th okay but, uh, uh, but you gotta let me do this just i have to <laughs> okay good night mary ellen <laughs> good, good night dave boy <laughs> no, you got a double name. Good night, David Lee. <laughs> oh, I think uh, it sounds like a, David Lee Walton. It was an honor and a pleasure to meet you, Miss Norton. Thank, Thank you very much for doing my show. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> I geeked out. I'm sorry. I couldn't. Yeah, you did. You did. Um, but it was fun. And what, what a what a nice lady. I know. Here's what I'm going to tell everybody who watches my show. I think we're like almost 20 shows in now. When I booked Keith Coogan, I didn't really think of him as like as a Walton star, but he was a he he appeared on the Waltons. I asked him one question and then he went on like a 20 minute diatribe about the Waltons. That wasn't my intention. Tonight was me geeking out about the Waltons. And uh and I was honored to talk to Miss Norton. It was an absolute pleasure and uh it was awesome to have her on. So does your wife watch these episodes? No. Uh <laughs> my wife uh well she watches it's it's very me and my wife are very uh, uh mushy and she can't go to sleep unless she's in her cuddle spot which is literally like right here in like my the crust of my arm and i i i, I literally tickle her her sleep and then like no exaggeration 15 minutes later she is like snoring to like where my innards are shaking so like i kind of shoo her to her side of the bed and i put the waltons on and I sit there and I blast the Waltons to drown out her story. So do you do like the hug roll motion like on friends? No, 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 no. I tell her, okay, honey, like this side of my body is now completely numb and dead. You have to go to your side of the bed. And when I'm lucky, she rolls over and goes to sleep. But sometimes she pulls this dirty double cross trick where she goes from my, uh, from my shoulder down to my hip so that I can really give her a good tickle. And then this is not, there's nothing dirty about this, believe it or not. <laughs> and then, and then, then she snakes me because she goes from the hip back to the cuddle spot over. And those are the nights that I watch like four or five episodes of the ones. Wow. Yes. All right. So All right. Your, your next guest is here. If you would. My, yes. My next guest is actually a friend of mine. We live in the same town. All this talent up here in Northeast Pennsylvania. My next guest is a super accomplished artist uh, and uh, just a great guy, Mr. Dan Parent. Hello. Hey, how Dan, how are you doing, brother? Good, good. I'm you sorry if that? I kept you waiting because I was oh, no, out. Fine. I'm a major Walton's geek. And, I saw uh, that, yeah. Uh, Mary Ellen, yes. I watch the, well, the Walton sometimes too. Uh, <laughs> one of those retro channels shows it on like at noon. Oh uh, really? Okay. I think it's like me, not me TV, but one of those one of those channels think, was at noon. I think it's I N S P, like inspiration or something. So one of those are um, are F E T V or some. I don't uh, know. I know me TV, me TV. I don't think it's me. Anyway, it's, I know it's on at noon because there <laughs> I'll catch it at noon sometimes. So. All right, I got to stop talking about the Waltons before George cancels my show. <laughs> How you doing, Dan? Good, good, yeah. Hanging in there, keeping busy drawing. So, how's everything on that side of town? Good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's pretty good. Um, you know, this whole pandemic thing is still, you know, kind of weird. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, I I sit home on a drawing board and just draw all the time anyway. So my life hasn't changed that much. So the only thing that's really changed for me um, is I used to do a lot of conventions, comic book conventions. Mm -hmm. So of course those aren't going on um, for the foreseeable future. So I'm just kind of doing. We're doing sort of like these like online conventions now, and trying to feel those out and see how those go. So yes, um, we did the very first online convention right here at the Indie Brigade back in March. So oh wow, that's cool. We're, we're trendsetters. Yes. We're yeah. So Dan, how did you get into becoming? Uh, an artist or, uh, or or a writer and an artist, a comic book artist? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was always a comic book fan growing up mm -hmm. from, from way back when I was like, you know, 
my, five years old, my parents were buying me comics and I was drawing and sketching all the time. And I just had a, just a fascination with comic books. Um, started with Archie and Harvey comics and then eventually got into superhero comics as I got older. And then uh, uh, in high school, I was into art, took all the art classes and then I just really wanted to um, pursue it um, as a, or try to pursue it as a, as a career. Um, when I grew up, there used to be ads in, in the comics that were like, if you want to be a comic book artist, go to uh, the Joe Kubert School of Cartoon Art. And it was a school in New Jersey. So I used to see the ads and I used to think, oh, that'd be so cool. Like, is it a real school? Like, what's going on with that? Is it real? And um, it's a real school. Um, I went there and um, it's a three year school. And, and in my, it's in Dover, New Jersey, not too far from here. And the third year of school, which was the final year of school, Archie Comics came looking for uh, talent. They were looking at portfolios and they saw my work and I started getting work from Archie when I was in my third year of school. So when I graduated, uh, they were, they hired me full time. So mm -hmm. that was 33 years ago and I'm still there. They, can't get, awesome. rid they can't get rid of me. <laughs> Who were some of the comic book artists that you were a kid that inspired you to want to become a comic book artist? Well, um, first and foremost, uh, Dan DiCarlo, who was the main Archie artist, and is you know he was really well known for his uh, how, you know, his drawings of Betty and Veronica and, and mm -hmm. fashions and things like that. Um, I was really in, uh, inspired by this guy named Warren Kramer, who used to draw for Harvey Comics, and he used to um, draw Casper and Richie Rich, which were characters that I really uh, grew up liking. And then over um, for at um, like for DC and Marvel, I just liked all the the great you know Batman artists, Neil Adams, and um, um, I like it. Uh, at Marvel, I loved um, so of course all of Stanley's you know creations. Of course, he was an inspiration. And um, and later years, even up to like twenty years ago, um, you know, I still collect comics. In the nowadays, and I like Darwin Cook, who's a great artist who um, unfortunately got to be, be, become friends with. Um, he sadly passed away a few years ago. Um, I liked uh, the uh, Hernandez brothers who had a comic called Love and Rockets. Um, so that's still going, actually. That was that was a comic that started an independent comic that started back when I was in Cuba school thirty some, some odd years ago, and it's still going. It's, the guys are still creating. And uh, so there's no no lack of uh, inspiring artists out there uh, that I follow. Now I know you are uh, were influential in doing some very very hip things with the characters in the Archie comic series. Can you expand a bit a little bit on what you did with them? Well, um, I sort of uh, I updated a lot of the um, the characters, um, the looks, and, and adding new characters and creating new characters. Um, around 10, 12 years ago, they, um, the old owners of Archie comics passed away. The new, the new management took over, which was, uh, Archie, just to go back a little bit, Archie's a family run company. So Archie's not owned by a corporation. They're still owned by the family that created them. Um, so, um, when the two, uh, um, guys who owned Archie passed away, the new family members came in and took over. And one of them, John Goldwater kind of looked at the, the company and he was like, feels like Archie is sort of stuck in like the fifties um, a little bit. Because Archie, you know, has been around for 80 years. So he's like, maybe we should, we could um, add some new characters, kind of spruce it up a little bit. So just started adding more diversity to the, to the, to Archie, um, adding more characters. And then I um, like, I created, um, oh, there's a sketch of mine. Um, Created uh, Kevin Keller, who was the first gay character at Archie Comics. Created mm -hmm. Kevin, who um, is now part of the Riverdale TV show. So um, yeah, so I just I guess I'm just known for sort of adding more like a little bit more um, of a modern twist to Archie. Um, like when I when I write, I also write stories too. So when I write stories, I try and tackle stuff um, just kind of modern issues. I mean, uh, without hitting people over the head with serious stuff. We, um, just like I, I like like TV a lot um, and pop culture, so I'm always doing stuff about you know what's popular in, in pop culture with the characters. And um, Archie Comics, if you look back at the 80 years of Archie, we're sort of like a time capsule um, of what's popular. 
you look, you can look at a, an old story and it, it could be about like, you know, poodle skirts in the 1950s or it could be about the Beatles in the 60s. So we're, we're all, it's, 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 we're always, you know, because we are, are working for a young audience. We're always trying to keep what's kind of like in the, in the mainstream. So, so yeah, so I just, you know, it's, I try, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to try and keep things relevant and it's, um, you know, it's, um, they've let me have free reign and let they uh, on a lot of stuff. And, um, they let me write a lot of stories and it's, it's just, um, it's been a great, um, great working relationship. So, so I have a question if I may. So the show Riverdale, yes. are the comics trying to keep up with that or total separate universe? It is, um, uh, it's pretty, pretty separate actually. Um, so what happened was um, about six years ago, Archie um, decided to go with a more is it a more modern look, a more like realistic look that looks more like you know like the stuff that Marvel and DC are putting out. So they had like an update. So even though the classic Archie still continued, which is which is what I work on, they had like the new Archie. So the new Archie was pretty popular, and that sort of inspired Riverdale. You know, it was a little more edgy, a little more a little more adult. Um, than the, the classic stuff. So, um, so then Riverdale you know, the, uh, became on the CW, became really popular. So there's sort of like like two two worlds that exist. Um, a lot of kids who watch Riverdale don't know even that there's such a thing as Archie Comics. So so um, parents have taught their kids. Well, you know, this is based on a comic book that I grew up on. Or when they are in like Walmart or, or a supermarket checkout, they'll see the Archie Digest. Those are the little books we work on, and parents will tell their kids, "Oh yeah, this is what we're, this is this came before Riverdale." So the classic product that we do is is sort of taken off too because just from people trying to discover the source material for Riverdale. So it's sort of like, but yeah, so the, so both worlds sort of coexist. I mean, there's people who who only like classic, and there's people that only like. Uh, Riverdale, but there's a lot of crossover. There's a lot of crossover fans who like who like to um, be involved with both. Awesome. What do you think has made Archie such a such a iconic and transcending character that he actually has sustained popularity for, as you said earlier, now 80 years? Yeah. You know, Archie is just sort of like you know, um, he's just a part of Americana. He's sort of like, you know, his Archie's as old, pretty much as old as Batman and, and, and Superman. Mm -hmm. So, so many generations have grown up with Archie that he's just sort of part of, like, you know, it, what, what people have grown up on. And um, so whenever we do, like, something, like, we've done, like, some, like, crossover or um, big storylines where, you know, Archie is going to um, choose a new girlfriend. Or Archie, we did a storyline where Archie got, we, we said it in the future, and Archie was going to get married. And that and that it was like a huge um, media event. Like it's amazing how many people cared about something like that. But it reflects on that. Art, a lot of people have invested their like a lot of their childhood reading and time into Archie. And um, people just um, the characters just are there. They, the characters just work because we've done so many versions of Archie. We've done Little Archie, where him as a kid. We've done like Archie three thousand in the future. We've done, we've got like you know Riverdale. And the characters just seem to to work in whatever situation you put them in, just because they're they're classic characters. So um, yeah, we're just sort of ingrained in people's um, minds at this point. And, it's funny uh, because when I was a little little kid, and I'm probably like the only person in the world who ever thought this, but when I was a little little kid, I always thought that the 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 Archie gang was kind of like the Peanuts teenage years. Mm -hmm. Did anybody yeah. ever make that connection um, to you? I think I think that's been mentioned. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. You know, it's sort of like, um, you know, I, when I was a little kid reading them, you know, and I was like probably you know, six, seven years old, and the Archie characters were all like 10 or 12, 10 or 11 years older, it's sort of like an idyllic look at what you hope your high school life will be like. Of course, mm -hmm. it never is, but, um, but it's sort of like, if you could have like the perfect uh, growing up experience, it would be like in Riverdale. Because it's like the perfect small town where you've got your friends and it's just sort of like this iconic place where you, you want to live. Mm -hmm. 
And Lance Wagner says, even if you're not a fan of comics, everyone knows who Archie and Jughead are. And that's very, very, very true. Jughead is probably the most uh, popular character. He probably has the most appeal. Um, even if people don't like Archie or one of the other characters, everybody, everybody likes Jughead. I, I don't think I've met too many people that don't like Jughead. He's the, <laughs> like, he's just the, the, uh, the, the cool rebel or the cool, um, you know, he's just sort of like his own guy, his own character. And, and I think people relate to that. And he's a little bit of an outcast too. So he's got all that going on. No, absolutely. It's just uh, one of the most iconic and uh, beloved comic book. And was it ever a cartoon? Yeah, it was a cartoon in um, in 1968. They mm -hmm. became a Saturday morning, and it ran for about 12 years, 11 or 12 oh, really? years. On, it, yeah, it was it was um, on Saturday morning TV for for a long time, and in 1969, it spawned a big hit called Sugar Sugar, which was mm -hmm. um, the first time I think that a cartoon character had had a had crossed over to have like a a hit on the pop charts. Um, so it was sort of like, um, yeah, it was the, there was an Archie's band. Um, then there was, the, then they actually put out actual records and there was a real band, you know, behind the scenes that was, you know, you know, doing the music for the Archie's. And then think that sugar, sugar was the number one song of 1969. So it was a huge hit that was turned down by the monkeys. Wow. Okay. Because the monkeys, well, the monkeys were trying to, um, they were trying to um, downplay their like um, kind of their goody goody image a little bit. And sugar, and pop, sugar, sugar was a real pop song. So they, they, I think uh, Don Kirshner um, were, created the song or brought, produced the song, but the monkeys didn't want it. And because the monkeys didn't take it, it was brought to the Archies and it was like mm -hmm. a huge hit. You know, it's funny. Now that you mention it, I think it was on, and maybe you might remember, but. Was it on like right on after or before Josie and the Pussycats? Yeah, yeah. No, I remember it. In fact, Archie had a block for, of of shows for a while because we also um, produced Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Oh, sweet. So we had um, on Saturday mornings we had actually I think there was four shows we had at one time because it was uh, Josie and the Pussycats, it was mm -hmm. Sabrina, it was Archie, and there was the Groovy Ghoulies. Oh, which was, I love the Groovy Ghoulies. Which was a spinoff. That was a spinoff from Sabrina. So so there was like four shows. I think and some of the shows were like an hour at one point. Like there was because they'd, have, they'd combine the shows together. So for a while there, there was like a, a two hour block of Saturday morning that was just um, owned by Archie. Wow. You know, it's funny. I always thought the Groovy Ghoulies were something to do with the, the old Monster Mash record. But I guess they were they were not related. And you know what, Juanita actually brings up, and I kind of remember this in the 90s. I don't know if this the correct. Archie, I was just going to mention that. Yeah. Was, mention that. was yeah. that the 90s? That was the 90s. Into the early 2000s, yeah. Archie's Weird Mysteries was, um, yeah, a show that's uh, like a Scooby Doo ish kind of Archie right. show that started in the, or I think it came out in 1998 and lasted until like early 2000s. But also very popular because it didn't have like a long run. But um, whenever I do conventions, people are always talking about Archie's Weird Mysteries. It still runs on a lot of um, like old channels, and it runs overseas a lot. So, yeah, that, that was another um, popular one. So let me ask you something about conventions. Mm -hmm. Do you think there are going to be any in the next six months? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm scheduled for some at the end of the year, so we'll see what happens. I was actually scheduled for one next week in Florida. But as we know, Florida is not the place you want to go right now. No, absolutely. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, must, you must know firsthand, right? Yeah. Yes, thank you. I was scheduled for a show in Tampa next week, and then what happened was, okay, I was scheduled for it at the beginning of the year. Then in March, when all the stuff happened, they kind of put a hold on it. And then in May, they scheduled the convention because the you know things were looking pretty good in Florida. And they were like, yeah, Tampa. It was a it was in Tampa. And they go, we think we can pull it off. So they had to re-sign me to do it. And I was like, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. You know, if, as long as we're social distancing and I'll wear my mask and my shield and all that stuff. And then about two weeks ago, um, they were like, well, no, they, we can't do it. It's just the numbers here are too high. And Well, so, yeah, Florida opened everything back up and then <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so I don't know. I mean, 
this I've got the like, New York Comic Con is still scheduled for mm-hmm. October. I'm very doubtful, but you know, I'll I'll if it, if it happens, it happens. Hopefully, um, and then I've got like um, there's a show in Memphis, Tennessee in October, and then I think there's like I, I did Awesome Con, which is in Washington D.C., and they moved that to December. So it's just a, well, we'll have to see like where where things are. It's it's just it's a, you know your guess is as good as mine. It's um, so weird because I had uh, five shows uh, scheduled for the rest of the year and I just canceled all of them because mm-hmm. I'm a nervous wreck. And yeah. I didn't. And now uh, I have a film coming out and I want to go out and kind of promote the film and go to different theaters and different screenings mm-hmm. and and meet people and meet fans. But it's just such a weird time, you know. It's kind of scary. It is. It is. And I was even considering, like, even if this Tampa show had been scheduled, I was getting very nervous too. And uh, I probably, if the, if I probably would have um, had to pull out, was I don't, I just couldn't see myself getting on a plane right now and going to a crowded uh, convention center. Um, but you know, I do think at some point when, like, in the Northeast, we're doing pretty well with the mm-hmm. the numbers. We want to stay that way. So I think there's going to be a point where they could do like small shows. Like if it's a small convention and you monitor how many people are in there and, and you use social distance, I, 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 they'll probably be able to do it in some, some way. Um, but it's just not quite there yet. Yeah. And, and, and the sad part is, is that uh, why people go to conventions is to go up and shake the people they adore's hands or hug them or take photographs with them and and that and that personal connection that that uh, that uh, i as a fan when i meet somebody or as somebody who if anybody's ever happy to meet me it's just uh that connection is is will be missing until uh, you know everything gets back to normal yeah i mean there is like a social element to it which i do miss um i mean i like working at home i'm used to working at home and not going anywhere anyway um a lot of people in my profession were like, this is, this pandemic has affected us very little. <laughs> There's so many artists to stay home and work at home. But but there is a social element, and that was that was the social element was getting out and, and meeting people at conventions. So um, yeah, it's, it's it's something that we all miss, and um, you know we'll get back to it at some point when when things are safe again. Yep. Well, Dan, can you tell uh, everybody watching where they can find you on social media? Yeah, um, my website's danparent.com. Um, you can find me on uh, Twitter. It's my handles at parent Daniel and Instagram. I'm also at parent Daniel on Facebook. Just Google, I guess just search for me on Facebook because I'm on there. Um, and I'm all over like social media. I'm I'm always posting sketches and, and things like that. So I'm very easy to find. So, uh, just, uh, look for me and, um, you can, like I said, danparent.com is probably the easiest way to find me. And you can always shoot me a message there. And um, yeah, I'll still be still be cranking out artwork and doing my thing. Well, Dan, you know what's cool though is even with online conventions, like right now, I'm going to be able to take a picture of this. And it's going to be me, David, and Dan, and I'm going to have that picture forever. Yeah, <laughs> and the luxury of our own, and the comfort of our own homes. Exactly. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> that's very that's very true. Well, Dan. Thank you, my friend. And Thank when you. all this crazy shit is over, I'd love to meet you at the diner and breakfast is on me. Uh, sounds good. We'll all right, Dan. Thank all you right. again. Be well. Thanks. Be safe. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Parent, a wonderful, wonderful artist and just a great guy. And part of one of the most iconic comic book series of all time, the Archie comics. I mean, you, <laughs> you couldn't go to a grocery store without seeing Archie. I'm sorry, I got to bring it like the Inquirer, Archie. Yeah, and... no, I know. It's like uh, it was a major part of growing up in the '70s, man. It was like Mad Magazine and Archie. Archie Digest, yeah. yeah. And I always reached for the Hustler, but you know. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I, you know, if I got paid by the by the word tonight, I'd be rich. I just never shut up. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for watching, Lance. Uh, so everybody out there, next week, July 10th, sadly, there will be no The End of the Night episode. I will be uh, with uh, Uncle Scott and Dante Hicks himself, Brian O'Halloran, at a world premiere screening of my new film, Wits End. 
uh, if we can, and if George and Joe will have us, we will uh, 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 gladly uh, try to uh, see if we can arrange something from the theater to hook up with these guys, if that's possible. That's, but that's totally up to George and Joe. Absolutely. Uh, but but uh, big news for our July 17th show. July 17th, uh, on the end of the night, we're going to have uh, a special, it's the day that Wits End comes out. So we're going to have a special Wits End episode uh, with uh, the entire cast of Wits End, uh, Brian O'Holloran, uh, Scott Schiaffo, myself, uh, and Emmett Garnham. Even my daughter will pop on for a minute. And uh, we're also going to have an all-star episode that night of uh, other celebrity uh, friends who are just going to pop in and wish me well, except for Tiffany Shepis, who was probably going to <laughs> pop in and give me the evil eye of the maloki or whatever the hell they call that thing <laughs> and uh so that the july 17th show you can't miss uh it's gonna be uh thank you lance uh, it's gonna be uh, uh one for the ages so, so uh you heard it here first so uh, yeah, i'm actually going to uh 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 i'm actually going to premiere on that night's episode some exclusive footage of wit's end for everybody right here on Romero Pictures Indie Brigade on the end of the night on July uh, 17th that night, Brian and Scott join us on the show. Uh, so you can get your first look, uh, real look at the movie. Uh, hopefully by that time, seeing it'll be out from like 12.01 the night before, you will have seen it already and you can chime in about that. Uh, well, thank you. I think Brian's a pretty awesome actor myself. Awesome guy too. And uh, good night, David Lee. Okay. Good night, Lance. <laughs> Uh, oh, he's doing a little John. I see what he's doing. He's doing uh, Wall's action. Uh, yeah, uh, see, you drink those pineapple smoothies and you're just on top. Is it pineapple or is it coconut? Pine pineapple, yeah. Pineapple smoothies. Stop licking the containers, Lance. I don't want you getting the COVID. You're yeah, doing, I like, ah, today. Yeah, he's like, yeah, I'm wiping them down. Nope. Oh, no, crap. Dude, you're, you're... Dude, dude, the person who handed you that was just done picking their nose or or Scratch touching their response and, and yeah and you're like like i i uh, uh i really lo love you guys and want any of you guys getting sick thank you sean I, I i i can't wait to show the movie to you guys i hope you like it uh it's a very uh it's uh it's it's funny and it's compelling and it's uh uh you know kind of heartwarming so you know we'll see if you guys you know what you think all right well another episode in the books mr ridgely uh, you anything you want to add before I wrap this puppy up? Uh, I I saw the movie yes. and I totally dig the movie. And again, I'm not the type to admit it. it, it certain part tugged at the heartstrings, and uh, it, it was exciting. It was a couple of what the hell moments, and it. <laughs> Very yeah, good. I think actually a lot of the banter between me, Scott, and Brian is actually historically funny. Uh, I think Scott actually, when you'll know the scene when the three of us are in the house together, he, Scott actually steals that scene. I think he's hysterical. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> when he goes, I can't take it. <laughs> I thought that scene was, well, I thought Scott was absolutely epic. So, uh, uh, if you're coming out to see us uh, on July 10th at the Pocono Cinema, uh, Brian O'Halloran and Scott will, and I will be there. Uh, seats are limited because they have to space in the theater. So please, uh, it's opening in Ohio, uh, New York, and several cities. So check your local listings on July 10th. And July 17th, it's uh, theater on demand throughout the country. So uh, please take a look at that. So with that being said, Joe, I think I will do my sign off. Well, I just want to make sure that we'll do whatever we can to get you guys on remotely next week. Absolutely. We uh, uh, The only thing, and, and please, uh, first of all, I have a phone from like 1912, so I think I'll, I'm think i going to hope that O'Halloran has his iPhone with him. I actually have a flip phone, Joe. You, I think you know this. I showed it to you. Uh, so I, I hope O'Halloran or Scott have their phones with us. The only concern I have is that we're doing it in one of these. Oh, it was a, a theater built in 1911. And it has those big copper walls and those sconce lances, uh, sconce lamps. And it's like one of those beautiful, beautiful antique movie houses. I don't know if we're going to get signal in there, but they have a cafe attached to it, which I suspect when people sit in there and drink coffee and stuff that they probably have Wi-Fi in there. 
So we're going to have the theater hook us up and uh, hopefully we could uh, talk to you guys live from the premiere. All right. We'll discuss it and try to get that done. Yes, absolutely. And if it's not July 17th, the entire cast will be here, exclusive footage and, uh, and, uh, Brian O'Halloran, the pop culture icon. Dante from Clerks himself will be joining us. So it's all good. He was a Chulies guy? He was a Chulies guy, yeah. <laughs> Scott Schiaffo was uh, actually Dante. No, he was uh, Dante Hicks. Dante Hicks. I was kidding. Everybody know. knows. Okay. Now, uh, do you actually remember what my line is from It's a Wonderful Life? Rosebud? Remember... Uh, you know what's funny? I remember it all week until I need to remember it. Are you looking it up for me? No, I'm looking at the comments going, um, yeah, sorry, but <laughs> there's Scott Schiaffo going, yeah, yes. <laughs> too kind. And uh, Sean asking if it's going to be on Voodoo and Eric showing some love. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> write it down, yes. <laughs> Uh, what the hell is the freaking line? You know what? No man is a it. failure who has friends. There you go. There you go. You think I should get it tattooed on my forehead so that when I look every night, I could just say, I could, well, it would be backwards. So I'd have to have him tattoo it backwards. All right. Give me my close up, Mr. Deville. Wow. He's getting demanding now. And thanks to George for that. <laughs> thanks to George for what? It, he, he, he's the one who said the quote, who told me the quote. Oh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, no man is a failure who has friends. Be well, everybody.